Hello and welcome to Torn Book Club. How did you uh, like that little bit of music there? That was creepy. Oh, I like that one. It's kind of Danny Elfman-ish. Yeah, definitely. Um, it's uh, actually from a group called uh, Two Steps From Hell. Um, I don't know if anybody out there is familiar with them, but they do a lot of uh, trailer music. And uh, and I stole has pointed out the screen went gray. Yes, dun, dun, that, dun. that was deliberate. We are in creepy spooky vision. <laughs> Black and white is creepy spooky vision. Yes, I don't know. <laughs> oh my gosh. Hey, I could. We're do, in the future. I could do all sorts of other weird, like crazy distortions with the video, but I'm like, I don't think people are going to want to. They watch don't want to see a funhouse mirror for an hour and a half now. Yeah, I can understand that. <laughs> but I figure black and white is kind of cool. Yeah. Okay. Of course, like, you're wearing, like, the most colorful shirt ever. I am. <laughs> There's got to be, like, ten colors in this shirt. I know. <laughs> like, it's, like, you walked in wearing that shirt. I'm like, oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> this show's going to be in black and white. No but, one's going to see you know, this. No, it, it looks, I think it comes across very um, stripey. Yeah. <laughs> it, it's it's stripey halloween -y. There you go. Yeah. All right. <laughs> so, in yeah. In person, it's more like clown bark, but on the screen, in black and white. <laughs> Yes. So, oh, so yeah, the, the music is uh, from this group called Two Steps from Hell. It's uh, okay. two uh, composers, uh, Thomas uh, Bergerson and Nick Phoenix. And basically they do most of the trailer music you've ever heard for like the last 10 years. Really? Yeah. So when they're not reusing Danny Elfman riffs, yeah. these guys come in. And well, I think that's what made them so popular was that they could, um, at least at the start, they could do a lot of different um, styles that you could that you could <laughs> at least at the start at the yeah well like they focus. were they were doing a lot of different uh, styles that were unique to popular composers like this one was clearly aping on Danny Elfman yeah uh, but they've also done like some good like John Williams I was gonna riffs. say they gotta yeah. do the John Williams thing mm -hmm. and Hans Zimmer thing yeah and, yeah, yeah they've got all of that they've got stuff that sounds like right out of Pirates of the Caribbean but then like later on oh, um, late, later on when they uh, they got more popular. Uh, they started like doing their own unique stuff, and like even um, even the latest uh, album that um, uh, Thomas Bergerson broke off and started doing his own. And his uh, his his, uh, <laughs> his his latest album. Uh, one of the pieces was just used in the uh, the latest trailer for. Um, Interstellar. Cool. Yeah. So they're still working hard. And so everybody's like, what happened? Why is the picture black and white? This is deliberate because we're in horror month. <laughs> it's not a technical difficulty. This, this is, is not a technical purpose. glitch. This is yeah. not a technical That's glitch. That's so funny. Everybody's like, what's going on? I don't understand. Things are different. <laughs> I'm scared. Change. It's unacceptable. Okay. <laughs> So yeah, this sorry, is... I just completely understand. No, yeah. <laughs> so we're we're going to be uh, doing this uh, for for the month of October because it is horror month, and we got a lot of different uh, topics to talk about. But first off, uh, if you are paying attention to the Facebook, uh, you saw me announce uh, book of the month for October last week. If you didn't. Or if you were watching it last week, um, I announced it there when I was up with uh, the Happy Hobbits. Uh, but for now, officially, um, the book of the month for October is Something Wicked This Way Comes by Ray Bradbury. Yay! And this is, this is probably one of my favorites. Um, not just because it's a good book, but I also really like the movie. I know you said you didn't really like it all that much. Um, no, I, I, well, you know, it's got that 80s cheesy thing going on. Yeah. And Ray Bradbury, to me, is like a writing god. So, it, um, it, it just, it has to be perfect. <laughs> It's like, it's like watching Stanley Kubrick's The Shining when you're me and you love Stephen King's The Shining. It's just, that's yeah. not right. Yeah, I know what you mean. Yeah. Even though everybody else loves it and calls you weird. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. We all have our opinions and everything. Um, 
but I I personally really liked it. So, and I also really like the book. Like, it's a really, it's a fun read. It's a fast read. It's creepy. It's different. Yeah. It has a lot of different elements that aren't typical of science fiction slash fantasy slash horror. Yeah. Uh, it, it, I would say, like, mostly it's, like, it's a coming-of-age story for uh, the two kids. Oh, yeah. And it's also just, like, a meditation on time and age, mm -hmm. uh, particularly with the father. Ooh, I'd say he's coming into his own. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, like... But that's what I like about the father character. I don't want to talk too much about yes, it because there, everybody there's needs to a read father it. character. Read it. Yeah. <laughs> but he's got a great arc. Like, he's one of my favorite yeah. arcs. Um, Rovandir is saying, I got recommended a book called Warm Bodies today. Apparently, it's some sort of zombie romance story. Yep. Yes, are, it is. Aren't zombies cold bodies? Yeah, that's the irony here. So... I don't even want to think about what that's about. I, I haven't read really 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 Bodies, but I've seen the movie. That's like Bob's Burgers, Tina Belcher. Yeah, stuff going on right yeah, there. that's yeah. A little, well, ah. well, okay. I, I saw <laughs> I saw the movie, so I don't know how closely it ties to the book, but um, in Warm Bodies, uh, the zombies are basically like. Basically, they become regenerated and become human again through the power of love. The <laughs> <laughs> That's the simplest well, way of putting it. Is this a fairy it. tale? Oh no, it's actually, it's actually like a very weird take on Romeo and Juliet. Wait, so they live at the end? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> nice! But, but there is a moment where they think they died. But they didn't. But no, they, they live. Yeah. <laughs> the movie yeah. itself is actually like pretty funny. Oh wow! Like uh, it's got a uh, Rob Corddry or no? Uh, <laughs> is it Rob Corddry? I can never remember which one of the two brothers. I, I think it's Rob Corddry plays his friend. And what's kind of what's kind of funny about them is like the zombies like they still think like regular humans, but they can't speak except in like grunts and like one words. Oh, I like that. That that entertains me. So it's like really funny, like how like they'll try to communicate with each other, um, like just using like one word grunts, like <laughs> food, <laughs> yes, <laughs> and then off they go. <laughs> wow, yeah, I gotta, I gotta check that out. That's, that looks interesting. It's, it's funny. It's it's really funny. If you go into it like tongue in cheek, it's actually kind of fun. Oh yeah, well you have to. Like, if you're going in like look, like hoping for serious uh, zombie romance, first of all, seek help. Yeah, Second I was gonna of all... say, what? <laughs> there, is there such a thing? God, I hope not. <laughs> I, uh, if there is a Tina Belcher out there who is real, I'm scared. For those of you who don't know, Tina Belcher is a character on Bob's Burgers, and she Everybody has. Everybody should know by right now. It's a great show. She is right. obsessed with uh, zombies, and yeah, she has a strange and relationship with zombies. She has erotic <laughs> dreams about zombies, especially when her grandparents are, are getting it on in the next room. Oh. What was that episode two? Oh. Yeah. <laughs> uh -huh. yeah. That's so, a so now that we've officially like yeah. freaked out everybody in the Seriously. chat, good job. <laughs> now we're gonna go to. Um, to let less creepy things, right? Because yeah, they're well, so classic. Yeah. Well, I mean, if you guys want a good horror book recommendation, along with uh, something wicked this way comes, I recommend Darkling by K. N. Rice, also known as Keeley from Happy Hobbit, also known as Kelly, also known as the guest on the show last week. Cool. Or she and her sister hijacked the feed. I love, I love the, you, you can't see the colors. The colors, I love the colors on the cover. Yeah. They're very subtle, but Yeah, and this was, beautiful. A, this was actually done by uh, her sister. Oh, that's great. Yeah, like they, uh, well, she took the picture and Kelly did all the Photoshop yeah, to yeah. make it work that way. But yeah, looks really cool. it's a really good book. Um, if you haven't read it, I highly recommend it. And yes, I'm shilling for Kelly, but she's awesome. So. Yeah, okay. Sounds like a good thing to do. So then, on to the classic horror. 
Yay. <laughs> like I stole the one ring. He's like shocking. Never saw that coming. Yeah, because you know I've never talked about this book on the show before. Never. <laughs> <laughs> And Haru runs to get a copy of Darkling out of book, out of her bookcase. Thank you. You already have it. Of course you do. I would imagine most of you probably already have it. But you know what? Give it another read. Tis the season. <laughs> <laughs> it's a good, creepy book. Yay. Those okay. So, on to uh, the classics. And there are definitely lots of classic horror books out there. And I sort of had to judiciously pick a few that sort of exemplify it all. Um, so I've got five for us to talk about. And these are all very early. I would say like uh, the earliest one, uh, <laughs> I stole the one ring and saying, Kelly should pay you. No, no, she shouldn't. I do this from the heart. That would be weird. <laughs> <laughs> um, but what was I gonna say? Oh yeah, so. So the, the earliest one is uh, early 1800s. Most of these are from the early 1800s to the late 1800s, most of which you probably know. Um, so Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah. So we're going to go in a chronological order of Yay. these, and we're going to start with... Frankenstein. Frankenstein, or Frankenstein, if you <laughs> pronounce it correctly, by Mary Shelley. <laughs> Um, okay, and I, yeah. I only read this book for the first time like a couple of months ago. Really? Yeah, for some reason like it just oh, wow. it never that's, crossed my desk until like just a little while ago. When, like, that's a when different I was, perspective. When I was looking for, for books to talk about, I, I started to realize, you know what, I've never read Frankenstein. I should really read this book. Yeah. And it was fascinating. Like I really liked it. Although like as with uh, many of classic horror books, I sort of feel like this is not technically a horror story. I was about to say yeah. it's more of an existential science fiction exploration yeah. of the human psyche. I, I, would, I would definitely qualify this more as science fiction than I would horror. There's not a lot of science in it, though, which was surprising to me when I first read it. Well, it, it's it's... The science is very abstract and vague. Yes. Um, and I think that's only because Mary Shelley herself um, was not as... And, and, pro probably did not have yeah. as much exposure to it. Exactly. Or to the intricacies of it. Because around this time, um, one of the big uh, scientific discoveries was... Um, and Temple is saying, if you've ever seen Prophets of Science Fiction, Ridley Scott talks about how Frankenstein is not only horror, but science fiction. And yeah, I, I hope he'd know that. Yeah, and I, and <laughs> I, did, I actually did watch that episode. Um, and so, oh. it, and I, I actually that. watched all of um, Prophets of Science Fiction. It was good, but it sort of didn't delve as deep as I was hoping it would. It doesn't show the, the amazingness of Philip K. Dick and how his adaptations have inspired us for generations. Well, it's got an episode on Philip K. Dick, okay, so well. that's something. <laughs> <laughs> but it focuses more on uh, his paranoid lifestyle. Oh, well, yeah. people are into that, you yeah, know. Yeah, um, <laughs> But uh, one of the big scientific discoveries around uh, Shelley's time was um, the discovery that if you uh, injected an electric current into a dead body, it caused a reflex action which sparked all sorts of crazy theories, like maybe if you put enough electricity in at just the right point, you can reanimate a corpse. Or cook it. Probably more likely <laughs> cook it. <laughs> but, oh, um, God, now I'm thinking, oh. Um, Sorry. But, uh, but it, more than that, it's very much a meditation on death because um, Frankenstein is a character. He had a lot of death in his life. Um, and went into went to school basically to learn how to bring back the dead like this was his obsession mm -hmm. and then and then ultimate irony of ironies when he finally achieves it it scares the hell out of him oh yeah when and his creation the first time he sees his creation he absolutely he's horrified by it yeah he wants nothing to it's do with it it's an abomination yeah which don't you think like he would have figured that out before or is I, it I just have, when well, the creature like maybe it moves in such an awkward way or something i, I don't know i i sort of feel like um 
it it kind of reminds me of like a little bit of like a Oppenheimer and the uh, Manhattan Project, where it's like you become so obsessed yeah, okay. with yeah. achieving the goal that once you achieve it, it's only and then, then you that you realize, realize what exactly what you've done. Thing you, yeah. yeah. Oh, I see that. Well, yeah, nobody liked him because he was he was ugly. he was hor he was horrifying to look at. And um, and he didn't have. Well, the thing that I always found interesting about Frankenstein is basically he's creating a new a new soul, a new personality. Yeah. And this the whole novel really focuses on the development of that personality, and we learn yeah. Frank um, Frankenstein's monster. Um, yeah. Or the creature? Do we call him the creature? Uh, he calls him the creature in the book. Although I guess, like at some point, he toys with the idea of calling him Adam. And the creature does say that he should be Frankenstein because Frankenstein's his father, so he yeah. should have his name. Yeah. Um, but with the the creature, you really follow his whole development because he's really like he's really he, like he's an a blank infant. slate. He's yeah, a blank slate, really. And um, I'm surprised he survived because that really that first night when as soon as he's alive, he's yeah, like he's beaten, kicked um, out. <laughs> no, everybody's scared of him, and like so, of course, he like goes all the way out into the Except middle the of nowhere. Except the blind guy. The blind guy, yeah. Thank you, blind guy. And then what and then, happens? And then when, like the family. Yeah, and um, then the. And the family is the one who really like helps him develop because they allow him to read books. Yeah, he uh, Frankenstein's monster well doesn't really shack up. He's basically hiding in yeah. the home near the home of a small peasant family yeah. and learns by observing them. He he learns by observing them, and he eventually begins to interact with them. But he never should, he never reveals himself to them and. Uh, I think it's the daughter starts uh, sharing books with him, or maybe it's the blind man. But there's a point where, like, yeah. he's basically he's reading everything. Like, he's reading everything he can get his hands on. He teaches himself how to read. He teaches himself like five different languages. It, it's pretty amazing. Um, and but then, like, there comes the point where he eventually does reveal himself to the family, and, and they flip out. They reject him, of course, yeah. and it is sad. It it's very sad and and so the in the creature's mind he realizes that he is so unique in this world that the only thing that can give him any sort of peace is to have another like him. A companion. Yeah, he needs a companion. And so he goes back to Frankenstein. He he hunts him down and basically tells him, You owe me this. You owe me a companion. Yeah. Um and it takes like it takes a lot of convincing on his part. Um, Doesn't it also but, take a little murder? Um, actually, no. The murder happens after. Um, after. 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 After um, Frankenstein after uh, um, accepts it. After Frankenstein agrees, okay, I will. I will make you a companion because, like, even then, like, he starts to realize, I did give you life and I did abandon you. I yeah. really do owe you something. And so he does like have sympathy for the creature, and so he's like, "Okay, I will do this for you." And then, I don't feel like he had enough sympathy. He, I feel like he was more terrified. He, uh, that could be too. Although, like the the entire book is told from Frankenstein, Frankenstein's perspective, and I sort of feel like the way he's narrating it, he does have some sort of sympathy for the creature. I think he wants himself to look better. But I've just finished Gone Girl, so... Okay. <laughs> um, but, yeah, the way the way I saw it was, like, he felt some sympathy for him, not a lot. And but, if, but he should feel but, more than sympathy. But he also felt, he like... Feel he felt obligation. He felt some guilt. Like... It's better. <laughs> but, but ultimately what happens is he agrees to it, and then he puts it off. And he puts it off. And he puts it off. Until finally, the creature is so frustrated with him and so enraged that he basically assumes that Frankenstein is just never going to do this and Which goes off in a, goes off in a rage and kills his wife. Frankenstein's wife. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I and that was my first experience of Helena Bonham Carter and something creepy. Yeah. The Kenneth Branagh uh, version of that movie. Which is not a good version, really. It, you know what? It, it's so funny. Um, it is, it's not great, but it's the closest thing. So 
um, things like in the textbooks in my like school, to, that's the... I, I would have agreed with that until um, they put out this theatrical version that was directed by Danny Boyle. Yeah, I, I stars a, that. It stars Benedict Cumberbatch and Johnny Lee Miller alternating roles as Frankenstein and the creature. Not in the same performance. Not in the same switching, performance. They, right. they switch yeah. uh, in different performances. And the one that I saw, uh, Benedict Cumberbatch was Victor and... Um, Johnny Lee Miller was the creature, but they do a really good job of showing the creature's evolution from like blank slate, mindless brute to this, this very like erudite, very passionate character. And he really is. The, the creature becomes a very sophisticated personality wise individual. Yeah. Um, he's just, you know, at forever an outsider because of his physical appearance. Yeah. Now, Aravandi is saying, I don't suppose anyone has heard of the old TV show Wishbone about the little dog who imagines himself as a character in a classic book. That's where I first learned about Frankenstein. That sounds really familiar. That might have been a little bit after my time as a kid, but um, I'm, I'm familiar with Wishbone. What was your first Frankenstein encounter? My first Frankenstein encounter was probably, probably the Karloff movie. I, I remember, like, watching, if not watching the entire thing, watching bits of it as a, as a kid. Um, so I, I got exposed to what is pretty much, like, the most widely accepted version of Which Frankenstein and also so the most bad. wrong interpretation of Which Frankenstein. Which is so funny. Um... My my first association with Frankenstein is similar, but I never saw the movie. I just saw Halloween decorations of mm -hmm. that green bolt-headed guy. Yeah. And then um, when I was a kid and we went to Universal Studios, you know, they have the monsters. Yeah. And right. we were in the tram and Frankenstein walks up to my little brother who freaks out. Mm -hmm. um, so I thought that was something I should look into. But uh, it, it was so... There, there's the novel is just so different and it's so yeah it, well I mean the big it's emotional the big difference of course is in the Karloff version the monster is nothing but a voiceless mindless dumb brute and he, stays that zombie, way through the, really. he stays yeah, that way through the whole movie um and it, <laughs> a little girl in the water <laughs> I know I know oh that upsets He's, me so much. Yeah, they, they, he doesn't develop at all. No, he, he There's doesn't no develop. There's no time. The, the entire premise of that movie is Frankenstein creates a creature, creature goes nuts, uh, villagers turn against There's the creature. There's a mob. <laughs> turn against the creature and kill it. And, I mean, I guess, like, somewhere in there you're supposed to feel some sort of sympathy for the monster. But they don't because, give you a lot of chances. Uh, well, I mean, towards the end when the village just, like, totally gangs up on him. Yeah. And kills him. <laughs> you're kind of like, you're like, oh, I, I feel a little bad for the creature. But I'm like, you should have been feeling bad for this guy through the whole three freaking movie. Yeah, you don't really get that. That's like at the end of King Kong when they try to make it about something meaningful, and yeah. they're like, no, it's a giant monkey. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, so I, I think everybody's still talking about Wishbone in the chat. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, so, um, but I sort of feel like what, what did, uh, Frankenstein such a disservice was the fact that this movie became, iconic. became iconic. There are tons of sequels. Um, and everybody and, else took that as a cue for their own adaptation. And, you know, for many years, like everybody said like, well, the monster is called Frankenstein. And that's one of those and, things. And like, I, that... I grew up, I grew up thinking that. Like, I didn't realize the distinction until like I was probably a teenager. I, and when I learned that, I was so upset. I felt like I had been lied to. I know, right? Like, <laughs> it's like it's like learning that Santa Claus isn't real. That was not cool. No, no. <laughs> and like, I, I don't know. I, and I feel I'm like Jewish, I took that. And I knew he never me, came to my house, but knowing that there was, I was Jewish. Santa Claus, I was Jewish, and he still came to my house because um, we were the cool family. Like, yeah, that. no, I, I did not. I just stayed up trying to listen to the sleigh bells when he went to my neighbor's houses. <laughs> but yeah, um, no, I, I sort of feel like I took that news magic. better than most kids. But even, <laughs> even still, like there was. A, you want magic? Yeah, you want okay. magic, and and like. Um, you sort of feel like with Frankenstein, like you are, you've basically been lied to. 
Like you've been told, yeah, that, really, you've been told yeah. that this like very tragic creature is nothing more than a dumb brute. Especially if you've watched the monsters. Oh yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you know what? That might have been like my first like exposure to. Well, that's what I've been thinking now. <laughs> it's it's you know the Halloween decoration classics and and mm -hmm. the monsters. Yeah. And um, the monsters scared me. I love the. Monsters. I love the Adams family, but the monsters scared me. Um, I, I, I loved them both. I, why is that? I don't know why. Well, okay. The way the way I've had it described to me, and I really like this, is uh, the Adams family is a normal family trying to be weird, and the Munsters is a weird family trying to be normal. The Munsters was more obviously slapstick comedy too. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's just kind of funny. We that's what we experienced. Our first re our our first encounters with these with this classic character is through comedy. And, yeah. and Young Frankenstein. I think I saw Young Frankenstein before I saw Wales Frankenstein. No, I, I know that I saw Wales Frankenstein before I saw Young Frankenstein. Um, yeah. I but, I mean, Young Frankenstein <laughs> is classic comedy. Young but. Frankenstein, the first time I saw it, I just, I, I didn't get it because I hadn't seen the original movie. And yeah, and I think that's why like, it wasn't I, the book. I appreciated it so much uh, when I finally did see it because I had seen the original. And for for all of its uh, differences from the book, the movie itself is still a classic. And I, the yeah. producers of the movie were not stupid. They knew what they were doing. They wanted to make something that was going to scare audiences. And mm -hmm. by God, they did. And they wasn't it such a conscious choice to make the creature a non-communicative... Didn't they offer Bella Lugosi the part or something? And he didn't want to do it because there was no... Yeah. It's the charisma with the I, character. I think I probably like it wouldn't surprise me because I mean at the time, um, like Lugosi was a really was hot, the man. He, he was a hot ticket item because yeah. of Dracula, which we'll get into later. Not um, quite yet. Not quite yet. Um, I stole one ring saying I never heard the Adams family described like that, but it's true. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, I, it, it's kind of eye opening when like. I used to read the Adams Family cartoons from the books by Charles Adams. I'd yeah. go in the library and I'd sit in the library, like in the aisle, and like pull the books off the shelf because they were naughty cartoons. Yeah, yeah. They were pretty dark. But <laughs> and Rovander is saying, honestly, I never saw or read Frankenstein. Well, I would read I, the book. I would read the book. The book. I mean, or even get an audio book of the book because yeah, there, that there's would be actually a great way to go. there's a really good version of it on a LibriVox. Yeah, um, I love it when they have good ones. You go uh, to LibriVox.org, uh, and these are all free. You don't have to pay for it at all. They're all they're all public domain. And the only unfortunate thing with that is they are split up usually by chapter, and at the beginning of every single track, they have a board for is LibriVox. A LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings <laughs> are the public domain. domain. For more information or to volunteer, oh please visit LibriVox.org. We've only listened to this about a Seriously. thousand times. I've listened to so many. And, and LibriVox, again, I think last time I was here, we, I was like, oh my god, LibriVox. Yeah. Um, but when no, you there, find a good narrator, yeah. a free audiobook is just like... And there, there is a good one um, for Frankenstein. I can't remember the narrator's name, but she also... Um, doesn't break it up by chapter. She breaks it up by like parts, so it's actually four really big. Oh, parts. that's cool. Yeah. yeah. Then you don't get as much of that. You don't get as commercial. many commercials. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, oh god, those blurbs. So yeah, I I would recommend checking it out. Like I I really enjoyed this book. Like it's it's not at all what we always thought it was. Like no, that's what I want to say about our culture. Not. Like um, I mean the conf the final confrontation between Frankenstein and the monster is actually like very tragic, and I'm not going to spoil too much about that. Well, it's it's heartfelt and yeah, and they literally go to the ends of the earth chasing each other. Yeah, it's, it's very it's it's a very human story, and it's about what it means to be human, mm -hmm. and. It, it's funny how it has been so transformed into yeah almost the opposite. Yeah, it it really is, and um, and the other the other thing is uh, how the story is framed. Um, like the framing device that's used in the book is very different from in the movie, or basically in just about any adaptation unless, I've seen. Unless so you see Kenneth Branagh's, they kind of, they, they, they try... They do it a little bit, but... they but, try to make the movie sexier, too, and I yeah. don't think that serves it. Well, like, the interesting thing with uh, the book is that the entire thing is told actually from the perspective of a ship captain. 
who is, who saw right. Who, he, he sees the creature yeah, and he takes Frankenstein right, yeah. on as a passenger. And then he gets and then, Fra- and then Frankenstein yeah, tells the entire story to him, which the captain in turn writes down in a letter to his wife, and which, that's what this book is. And and that that and you know that's so funny because. I read Frankenstein after I read Dracula, which we will eventually get to, and it yeah. has a very similar yeah, and there, device. Yeah, there is a specific style. This is this is actually a certain kind of style, and I can't remember what it is called, but it had to do with uh, how, like, I don't, because Frankenstein and Dracula about. are so far apart time timeline-wise. It's pretty amazing. But, um, but this style is basically, like, to tell a story that's a direct narrative was like kind of frowned upon, like probably I think by the church in some way. Like any anything that was a direct narrative that wasn't biblical was apparently not good. <laughs> so so a lot of writers would get around that by telling stories framed as journal entries or as letters. I always feel like it was a fad. And I also feel like, especially in the case of a book we will talk about in the future, it it tended to add maybe what we could imagine as a little realism for yeah. the readers. Yeah, like the, um, the way I would describe it is sort of like an early version of found footage movies. Um, that is definitely correct. Uh, Temple is saying, in a way, the Frankenstein monster is the most human character, and it's about how monstrous humans can be when confronted with difference. That, yeah. That, that's very true, and I think that that, um, that message is definitely hammered home probably a bit more bluntly in the movie with the entire village, like, taking up arms against him. And, but then again, in the movie, you don't feel as much pity as you should yeah. for the Yeah, well, creature. because because it's all in the third act. He's like, and, and he's like, in the movie, he's more and, like a and puppy. You, and you can't really have too much sympathy for the creature yeah. because early in the movie, he kills a child. Well, maybe she could swim. <laughs> I, I love that part because it's just so off the cuff. Like, it really oh, is. Okay. Yeah. It's like, what? <laughs> it made it a comedy. And maybe at the time it was a lot more frightening because maybe less people knew how to swim. I don't know. I don't know. But, okay, so we've talked about Frankenstein yeah, long enough. Read it. Frankenstein it's, a, it's a very good story. It's a it very is. good book. I highly recommend it to anybody who hasn't read it, which is apparently most of the people in the chat. And if you don't, um, actually, I, I gotta mention this. Frankenstein is really popular right now in schools. Oh. Um, and even at the junior high level, reading adapted versions of it. Really? The kids really, really go for that whole idea. Maybe it's because, you know, they're going through the whole becoming a human adult process themselves. Interesting. But it is, yeah, it's something that I know a lot of teachers have used in their classroom. Oh, cool. Yeah. Yeah, I'm definitely going to have to, uh, yeah. I'll, it, it, you, you should all check it out. Technically, it's yeah. a good book. You it, should read it. Technically, it's a good book, yes. <laughs> so, that must be the official. So Frankenstein was written in 1818. Yeah. So this was a early 19th century. Um, or I should say it was published in 1818. And it was actually originally Didn't published. Her, yeah. Uh, it, it took her, I think, about two years or so to write it. And, I mean, we didn't talk a lot about Mary Shelley as a person, but she had a lot of tragedy in her own life. She had an interesting life. And so there's there's no doubt that that inspired some of this obsession with death and resurrection. Because, yeah. Uh, yeah. Hey, I think same goes some, for Anne some, Rice. Somebody mentioned earlier on she about how she lost a child. I yeah. think she lost like three children or oh something like God. that. Like, yeah. Well, you know what? That that is interesting. Direct comparison. Yeah. Anne Rice wrote about a little vampire child. She lost a daughter to cancer. Oh yeah. That's where Claudia came. Uh, Claudia came from. Claudia. Yeah. yeah. God, it's been a while since. I've well, seen yeah. Those. Well, we're going to talk Anne Rice at the end of the month. Go, do, okay. Yeah. No. That's, yeah, yeah. Exactly. Mm-hmm. Definitely. Uh, but and how yeah. horrific it was when she went back to Jesus. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, Anne Rice uh, we'll, we'll get to later in the month. So moving right, on from yeah. uh, Frankenstein, we're going to go to about mid-century or so, 1840s, with a phenomenon uh, known as the Penny Dreadfuls. Um, they were dreadful. 
No, I haven't watched. You gotta tell me. Have you seen the television show called Penny Dreadful? I have, and actually, I'm gonna be working on season two. Oh, so, so can you talk about it? I then? can. Oh, about talk. season one, maybe. Season one, I really <laughs> liked. Um, how does that? How does that compare to? Okay, Penny Dreadful novels were serialized, cheap, mm -hmm. pulp. Basically, pulp the, fiction. Yeah, um, no, they, they were the origin of the old uh, uh, pulp fiction, age. fiction yeah. novels. And what's interesting about Penny Dreadfuls is, yeah, they're serialized. They were called Penny Dreadfuls because they were dreadful, and, and they, cost, they cost <laughs> penny because they were printed on pulp stock. Yeah, and and they were they were really like very dark, horrific dramas, mostly like crime dramas. And basically, all of the stuff that if you're like. Like, if you're like me and you enjoy the TV show Hannibal and people judge you for that, you know, this proves we've always been into this. Oh, yeah. <laughs> we've always been into these we've, dark We've always been stories. into this sort of thing. And I mean, like, yeah. there was, there was a, there was certainly a culture that was into this stuff back in the 1840s because it was a really tough time for a lot of people, so. Oh, yeah. So, I, it, well, it's, it's an interesting. <laughs> it inspired. Yeah, it, it, it's an interesting thing with society where, like, if things are going bad economically, people will tend to gravitate more towards horror mm -hmm. or towards violent crimes. So is that why we have so much zombie stuff going on the past I, I sort of feel like that's probably why we have so many um, so many post-apocalyptic movies these days. We, yeah, they keep remaking Richard Matheson stuff. Which they're going to do again. I know. Maybe I'll get it right this time. I don't know. <laughs> well, I have the Vincent Price one. I, uh, the Vincent Price one is great. Yeah, and um, I, I boycott Will Smith, so I. The Will Smith one was weird. Yeah, um, it, but yeah, this this new version is actually was actually picked up by the studio. It was a script that actually wasn't I Am Legend. It was a script that somebody wrote uh, and put on uh, the blacklist, oh. and they picked it up and basically retold it to fit into the I Am Legend universe. That's a unique way to approach something. Yeah, but it's not the first time. I mean, that's what Ocean's 12 was. Is it? I don't know. I yeah. only saw 11, and I got tired of everybody in it, and there's <laughs> smugness. Yeah, yeah. All those smug white people. <laughs> <laughs> so, um... But anyway, talking about talking about the Penny Dreadfuls. Penny Dreadfuls, yes. <laughs> um, so uh, the most famous one, or probably the most recognizable one, is um, a serial called uh, The String of Pearls, which you would probably know as the uh, introduction of the character of Sweeney Todd, the demon barber of Fleet Street. Mm -hmm. The famous musical that was kind of ruined by Johnny Depp, but will we'll it um, wasn't. It wasn't the worst thing I've ever seen. Nah. That was Phantom of the Opera. The Phantom of the Opera. <laughs> yeah. Um, um, what was I just going to say about that? Oh, but before the musical, there was um, a straight play, yeah. and that's where um, Stephen Sondheim took uh, the idea and, and uh, created the musical. Yeah, and made the musical based yeah. on a play, which was based on the Penny Dreadful story. Because because that's what they would do was they would take these. Um, they would take these penny dreadful stories and they would produce cheap plays based on them. And even in uh, the show uh, Penny Dreadful, they there's a point where um, a character who I'm not going to spoil who it is because they I don't even know who the characters are. <laughs> well, the, th the thing with Penny Dreadful is that a lot of the characters are actually characters from classic horror. Oh, okay. So I don't want to say. I can who, see. I can see how. Yeah. Okay, that works with the title. I, so I don't want to say who this is lest I spoil. Yeah. Um, of course. But there's a character. He starts working for a theater. And the theater is producing a play of Sweeney Todd. That's interesting. Yeah. Um, <laughs> uh, so, oh, we got a new one. Uh, Tolkien Girl. I have stumbled upon the, Tol the Torrent Book Club. Hooray! <laughs> Welcome, <laughs> Tolkien Girl. We are talking horror today. Hey, meat pies are delicious. Especially when they're made of... of, of Okay, wait. No, no, we're not going there. <laughs> you, you know what? I was just reminded of something. I have to look up while you talk about... Okay. Because you know more about The String of Pearls than I do. Yeah, I, I recently read The String of Pearls, um, and it's wildly different from uh, what we know of, uh, or the story of Sweeney yeah. Todd that we know. Um, for one, the big one is um, Sweeney is not Joanna's father. Um, yeah, that's I remember reading that. Um, and the story, the story actually picks up 
with uh, Sweeney and Mrs. Lovett already in cahoots. Like, they're, they've got their enterprise going. So he's not the protagonist? Oh, no. Oh, no. Okay, yeah, that's uh, very different. Uh, the protagonist is uh, is Joanna, pretty much. And um, uh, I Stole the One Ring is saying, what's the String of Pearls? Uh, the String of Pearls Sweeney is... Sweeney Todd. It, it's essentially <laughs> Sweeney Todd. It's, it's, a, it's an old said, penny, yeah. penny dreadful serial. Um, now, they say the author is unknown. They pinned it down to who they think the author was. Really? Uh, there were like maybe two people, and it might have been a collaboration. Um, that but would make yeah, sense. but yeah, originally, um, like for the most part, uh, the author of the String of Pearls is unknown. Um, it was wasn't it? I mean, really, Penny Dreadfuls were the kind of thing you wouldn't want to admit to writing, would you? I, I suppose it's not because trashy it, literature. It, it really is trashy. So, yeah. <laughs> but I mean, there were there were lots of. Um, but it's a classic now. So but, read but, it. But I mean, it, it sold very well, which is why like it took off and uh, was the progenitor of the uh, pulp fiction novels and the sci-fi stories, the pulp sci-fi books that eventually became like we Asimov science fiction. Well, and yeah, yeah. Um, it's funny. But. Um, so, Tolkien Girl is new here, has never listened in before. Well, I hope you enjoy it. We're, we're talking uh, horror stuff uh, this week and every week this month. Um, yeah, Tolkien didn't go there, but did he? Not so much. Well, I mean, there's the Paths of the Dead. They were kind of scary. Yeah, I know. I'm trying to. I'm thinking of specific creatures, actually, right now. I was like, that's kind of horrific, and that's yeah. kind of horrific. Yeah, no, the... But the, the orcs were kind of yeah scary. exactly. That's Saruman was kind of scary. Yeah. Okay, we've got <laughs> um, all that, we, we've that got, mythology. There, here. there are horror-ish elements in Lord of the Rings and in uh well, I would I would say probably even more in the Silmarillion, but I'm afraid of that. I could. There's a. There's, there's too, too much. much. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, so anyway, we're talking Sweeney Todd right now, mm -hmm. um, and one of the things that. Uh, I found so interesting about this story, The String of Pearls, which is, as I said, the origin of Sweeney Todd, the original Sweeney Todd story, is that it's really a murder mystery. And it's a... Uh, and, and you realize early on, like, um, it's all focused on uh, the disappearance of... Um, what's it? Uh, of a sailor. Mm -hmm. Who go... He, he's basically just come back uh, he's got this extremely expensive string of pearls that he's going to give to his uh, fiance Joanna. Joanna. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, I'm remembering the the blurbs I read now. Yeah, and and so he goes into Sweeney Todd's for a little touch up before he goes to see her, and he disappears. So that's the Anthony character, Anthony Hope. Kinda. There really is no Anthony character they, they equivalent. Really, yeah, it's so much different from the story we're familiar with today yeah like and there are a couple other sailors who also start to investigate this disappearance and they join up with uh, joanna to try to find out what happened to him yeah yeah yeah. and meanwhile you have uh sweeney's poor assistant tobias who is toby in the play yeah, yeah. who is just abused and he's basically threatened the entire time he's there because okay. Because, like, he has access to this information. He has access to what Sweeney is doing. And basically he says, like, if you if you say anything, if you tell anybody, then I will rat your mother out to the church for something that she did and she will go into the stockades. Jeez. I, he's, he's brutal. Like, Sweeney, he, Sweeney is truly evil in this. And that's what, that is incredibly different. Yeah. From, I mean, the... the whole the day oh, is all toby finding this stuff out and i didn't even get into what's going on with mrs lovett because yeah that's got to be even more interesting because she's her business is booming in this story like this is this starts before is this she start, the mcdonald's of the time he's <laughs> kind of kind of pretty much <laughs> like Everybody's coming in for, for a meat pie. Everybody's coming in for the veal pie or the steak pie. And she's just churning them out left and right. Like, she's got, like, this whole production going on. And it all comes it all comes down to she has a guy in down in the basement in the bakehouse where basically he is threatened 
under death that if he leaves in any way, he will be killed. Is he and chained he, up and stuff? Like he, he's in he's in a room and he's basically there to just make the pies. And like, and she tells him, "You go into this locker to get the meat. The meat will always be stocked. Don't ask where it comes from." Oh my God, she's got a pie, Igor. Yeah, she's got a pie, <laughs> Igor. Um, and well, yeah, that's that's and, really. And so like this guy is like just basically, basically her slave, just like making pies left and right, and. <laughs> Wow. And the whole the whole way it works is um <laughs> all I hear is girls like all I hear is guy in the basement. Nope, 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 nope. <laughs> so many notes. <laughs> Yeah, that's so but like I mean Silence of the Lambs. You've got a is. girl in a <laughs> It is, it oh is. Oh my like, god. But like what's even creepier is like hundred and fifty years ago. Like how um how Sweeney uh gets his victims. First of all, he chooses his victims by how rich they are. Well, okay. So but so he, he robs them, right? He, 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 he robs he robs them. Like okay. this this is the criminal enterprise he's gotten with Mrs. Lovett is the I think it's he, brilliant. He will <laughs> he will rob and kill the rich customers who come into his shop and then give the bodies to her. Uh, so she does all the butchering herself. Yeah. She must be a strong woman. Well, I I don't know. I don't I, think she's Helena Bonham Carter in the no, original no, story. No, she's I, a beefy I, gal. I sort of feel like maybe he does the butchering himself because because uh, one that of the, would make more sense. Because one of yeah. the things that he does, and you can kind of see it on um, in this cover here. Uh, what he does is he doesn't actually uh, slit the throats yeah. with his with his straight razor. What he does is he has this special chair that's actually. Is it a trapdoor chair uh, it's for a, the yeah, that It's a trapdoor chair, but what it does is it spins upside down, drops the person 20 feet into a into the catacombs beneath the store, and hopefully that kills him. And if it doesn't, Sweeney goes down and finishes off the job. So, oh, see that I got a reflex. Yeah. <laughs> so like you can you can see like that chair is such a I mean that's part yeah. of the the musical play that people are it's so amusing you've got this whole stunt thing going on um, yeah so you can see like the yeah chair, yeah the chair device here is actually two it's like it flips over so it's very different from uh it, from from what you see in the play how, how things have been adapted yeah and one of the things that I find so. <laughs> One one of the things that I found like very fun about it was um, was <laughs> Joanna Joanna's character. She's she's the daughter of a spectacle maker, guy who makes glasses. Yeah, yeah. And his name is Oakley. I find that <laughs> hilarious. <laughs> That's Joanna Oakley. Joanna daughter Oakley, of the, daughter of the spectacle maker. I've uh -huh. I've tried this new thing, daughter, with smoked lenses. <laughs> So that's uh, <laughs> that's Sweeney Todd. Those are the Penny Dreadfuls, and and those... there were a few of them. Yeah, uh, it, like so much Pulp Fiction stuff doesn't last. And yeah, unless but, you've got a titanium ball for it. But what they also do is they inspire lots of stories uh, coming coming on later on, and yeah. that's when we move on to the next in our series of classics that we're looking at. <laughs> The Strange Case of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde by Robert Louis Stevenson. Okay, you gotta call it. This is what? This one? Uh, as what? far as, as River Song's favorite word besides sweetie. Oh. The biggest spoiler. Oh, yeah, spoilers. <laughs> spoilers, yeah. Okay, we have... Well, you see, here's the thing. is like, everybody knows the spoiler of this story. We all know that. It's, well, I, I feel like now I shouldn't say it because maybe there's like one person who has. There, not, there is no way. No there way. is one person yeah. out there who does not know this. It's a, it, yeah, there's. Basically, it's safe, right? Jekyll and Hyde are the same person. <gasps> no. Yeah, I know. Oh right? my god. Oh, but, oh, you just ruined like ten movies I've already seen. I know, but <laughs> but the crazy thing is that when you read this story, but um. 
the story, the whole point the, of the story is that's the big twist at the, the end. The big twist at the end is that they are the same person. And it's a great twist, except yeah. you start the book pre-knowing this, and it takes away, and I think, so much. But, it, um, it really a does. great story. It, it really is, like, just a fascinating story about... And um, it's scary. A, it, it's basically about, like, this doctor who you think is being... Um, Put upon. Or he's being harassed by this guy, Hyde. And Edward Hyde. Ed, Edward Hyde. And yeah. he's like, and he's very, he's very creepy. He's very Who, ugly. by the way, is a little, like, not necessarily a midget, but he's small and ugly. He's hunched over. He's like a little creepy hunchback. He's not a yeah. big monster at all. He's this little yeah. creepy. He, he lives in this building that is completely unmarked, has no lights. Um, meanwhile, you have... These, char these other characters who are basically sort of running the business of Dr. Jekyll's work. Uh, and observing. Observing him and sort of like setting up his uh, will. And they all get freaked out when he, when Jekyll changes his will and wills everything to hide. And isn't the goal, it, it has to do with prolonging life, right? And health. Yeah. Um, well, no, it, it, it sort sort of like prolonging life. Like basically, um, Jekyll's whole theory was, oh, Ravandir's leaving. Bye, Ravandir. Uh, um, so uh, Jek Jekyll believes in this uh, duality in humanity. Like we have we have a good person and a bad person within us, and so he devises this chemical concoction that separates the two out because he fig he he figures that if you can separate the two out and then isolate the bad and focus on the good then you can have a more fulfilling and longer life and and the thing okay i want to say that we don't understand his process until the end no we have no in, in we, we have no of inkling have of no any idea of this. that yeah. there is any sort of science fiction going on really you know he's doing experiments you, you, you know he's doing some weird experiments but um, you don't know exactly anything and that's one of the things um his friends discuss him and about how it's a mystery and mm -hmm. there's this mysterious young man in his life now who is hyde yeah and and they <laughs> they start theorizing that maybe Hyde has something on him, yeah, or is like holding something over him. him. Yeah, and and Hyde is, and the, and they and they become convinced of this, and they are tracking him down. They've got like this whole this whole plan to expose Hyde and to. Meanwhile, and, Hyde's doing a lot of criminal damage to yeah. his own reputation. Um, yeah, he. I remember specifically he like steps on a little girl and then just yeah, gets mad and starts beating her. That that's basically how we first meet yeah, Hyde. Is he's, he's he's running through the square and doesn't even pay attention, runs right over this girl and doesn't even stop. Yeah, uh, yeah, he he's and, and, oh, and it's only God. like when one of the characters uh like says, Hey, you just ran over this girl He's like, Oh I did? Oops, sorry. <laughs> yeah, he's um definitely a sociopath at the least but um now i'm thinking you know what i'm thinking of i'm thinking of that horrible i mean the john malkovich bits were okay but did you ever see mary riley no i never saw that one if you fast forward the julia roberts stuff mm -hmm. it is an interesting that that was why if I, it wasn't for her yeah that was why i couldn't I watch say. mary riley because yeah. julia roberts with an irish accent just yes. julia roberts in anything but yeah especially i feel like it was pretty bad but john malkovich really that was a. Um, so apparently, Tolkien Girl is me. really getting into Halloween now. Blair's Thriller turns on The Walking Dead and runs around decorating everywhere for Halloween. And typing at the same time. Wow. You are skilled, I Tolkien Girl. I can't do that. <laughs> I can't. I can sit still and talk at the same time. <laughs> <laughs> and there we go with the Sherlock quote High functioning sociopaths, do your research. <sighs> I know, I we know. We already got, went through that. I know, you've you got, you got your Sherlock issues. <laughs> no, I think I've got issues with Moffat and Gattis, actually, about that. Yeah, well, they're, they're the ones who yeah. decided that. Mm -hmm. uh, but any, anyway, um, so... Um, Different sort of sociopath than what we're talking about. Yeah. Hyde so, doesn't solve mysteries. No, Hyde, them. Hyde is, well, yeah, Hyde is pretty much the mystery. But, I mean, there's also the mystery of, like, what happened with Jekyll? Why is he... Why does he keep getting sicker? Yeah, he, he's, he's getting sicker. Older. He, he's getting more paranoid. 
and yeah and it's only in the last part of the book very end of the book the very end like it's broken into five parts told from five different perspectives and it's only the last one that is Jekyll's letter to his friend where he reveals Just, yeah. the entire thing and actually the big twist comes when um he it's like after uh Jekyll supposedly dies and he tell he leaves a he leaves a letter for his friend saying take these things out of my lab bring yeah. them here wait for my assistant and he will he'll come and tell you everything and so the guy waits and the assistant comes in and it's Hyde and and the guy freaks out and Hyde and he's like wait I have to show you something and Hyde drinks a potion and transforms into Jekyll and then we go into Jekyll's story where he tells everything that happens yeah you get the whole backstory at the end but it was like it's this really big twist and except it's not it but you know what i like in the 1870s back that then must that, have been so that must great. have been mind-blowing oh my god that's that's what i keep <laughs> and, thinking How and that's probably that why this story endures so much because it blew so many minds a hundred years and ago and i think also we've got in in every now I'm thinking of Iroquois creation myths. We've got this idea of a duality of nature and human mm -hmm. beings, and I think yeah. that's something that we really we latch onto that concept in that story. Yeah, and and like what what's really interesting is like there's this, this is another thing that I wanted to talk about was like all the different misconceptions that we have with these stories that have come over time. Mm -hmm. um, like with Frankenstein, how he how the creature is not a mindless brute. Yeah. Um, and with uh, He's a philosopher. With with Sweeney Todd, how he is not a romantic lead. He is in fact <laughs> an evil bastard. Yeah, um, it's completely different. And uh, with uh, with Jekyll and Hyde, what we have um, We just have a we, huge spoiler. Well we we have a <laughs> huge spoiler, but we also have like the idea that we have is that um uh what what is it um this idea that when when Hyde is in control it's totally Hyde and Jekyll like you have this duality where the two of them don't even know one each or other the other and they it's, don't yeah they're not aware of what the they're, other they're one. not aware of the other one which in this case is not true because Jekyll is very aware of Hyde mm -hmm. um and he's doing everything he can to stop him and in the same way Hyde is very aware of Jekyll and he's trying to stymie him and and so like in in the very end of the story when you have this letter from Jekyll explaining everything he basically ends it by saying I don't know how much time I have left yeah. because Hyde is going to come back and I'm not sure I can keep him down this time and that's it's so ominous and yeah. it's such a great ending and it is it's one of those books that when I finally did read it I went oh I wish I didn't know yeah I wish yeah, yeah, like that's that's kind of how I felt too. But it's like at this point, there is no way you don't know. Exactly. It's, it's and that that and, makes me want to read it to a kid for a bedtime story. So you know, like you, yeah. they get it immediately. And it's of not course, you're going to traumatize that kid for life. Well, but... you, you you could rewrite it a little. You know, maybe maybe I it's, suppose it's about you know a naughty little boy or girl who turns into a good little boy or girl. I don't know, but <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Basically, yeah, that. But yeah, it's, it's, it's an excellent book, and it's, it's short. It really is kind of like short it's really up there, book. like with um, uh, with Darth Vader being Luke Skywalker's father. It is like it's a the big reveal. Like the twist was amazing and mind blowing it when you when it first Skywalker came out and you didn't see it coming. But now everybody knows we have three movies talking about it's it. It's been over a hundred years, you know, hundred fifty years. Oh my gosh! Wait, how long has it been? Well, Do you remember since Star Wars? No, oh, no, I'm, I'm thinking it's Jekyll been 37. And Hyde. I know no, Star Jekyll, Wars is as old as Jekyll and Hyde. Um, Jekyll and Hyde was probably about 150, 120 yeah, years. Yeah, and like in that. in that time, oh, you know, my favorite Jekyll and Hyde adaptation is the silent film with John Barrymore. Oh yeah, his Hyde makeup is oh, it, freaking creepy. It, it's creepy. It's very creepy. It is really creepy, and I don't even like Nosferatu, so mm -hmm. Every, that, that was a pretty impressive. Everybody's thing. talking about how they don't like horror. But but Jekyll and Hyde isn't really horror. Jekyll and Hyde, I would say, is more of a mystery with a sci-fi twist. Yeah, yeah. And now, in retrospect, it's become we've it's, turned it into the you know we we've, we've created this genre. Yeah. In retrospect. Oh, did we just 
Did, did we just did spoil Star just Wars for Tolkien Girl? For I'm sorry. I felt so glad that wasn't spoiled for me because that I, was awesome. I, I was like, I was at the right age to receive that information, and that was great. Yeah, I, I didn't see it till it was on till um, on VHS, but yeah, certain things that which. <laughs> I, I am so sorry, Tolkien Girl. I can't believe it hasn't been ruined for you before. <laughs> I'm, I'm actually like... I, I, it's like Jekyll and Hyde. I, I, feel, I feel very sad now. Like I did not realize that there was somebody out there who did not know this. And Yoda's Star a Wars. Muppet. Shut up. Sorry. Wait, Yoda, he, he's going to be a Muppet again. Like in the, Yoda, Yoda is real, and you shut your mouth. In the, in the, in the new... Old, Episode 7? Yeah. It, are they going back to the Muppets? I hadn't heard. I'm really not. Uh, I, I haven't been. Paying like I've been attention. trying to ignore it as much as possible. Yeah. I, I mean, I saw the thing oh, yeah. with the Batmobile and the Millennium Falcon. I was like, okay, that's cool, but whatever. <laughs> the Millennium Falcon is the Winnebago of space vehicles. It really is. And we all need to admit that. Especially now. So, <laughs> I'm sorry, Tolkien girl. I'm sorry for spoiling that for you. <laughs> I, I, I just yeah. I, I figure everybody knows. Yeah. Because, and oh, but you know what? I teach high school, and all of my teenagers, their first Star Wars are... Phantom Menace. Yeah, yeah so yeah. they grew up. Yeah, they've got a different yeah, but, perspective in it entirely. Yeah, pretty much. Okay, so, um, yeah, Jekyll and Hyde. Jekyll and Hyde, really good. Great book. Unfortunately. Completely ruined by his history. Just yeah, time. Yeah, just time. Time and like time the fact took it from the us. fact that when you have such an amazing twist, it doesn't stay a secret for very long. Yeah. And, and Temple points out, wasn't the ship of Winnebago in Spaceballs? By God, it was. Yeah, it was. Mm -hmm. um, gee. Mm -hmm. And I happen to think it is an apt sort of comparison. Yeah, it I, really is. I mean, people need to face it. The Millennium Falcon's not cool. No, it, it's a it's you a got, junk pile. That's the and that's what's cool about it. Okay. Yeah. Sorry. Uh, the original. Okay, I was very careful not to hear spoilers about the original. I've seen episode four, the prequels, only one and two, Wait, and the Clone Wars in... animated series. I only just put in Star Wars episode seven to watch while listening. So you're to telling this. you're telling what? us that this is by a matter of minutes. <laughs> what? <laughs> Are you kidding me? <laughs> <laughs> like, like if you had to tune in to the podcast, or, or I love of, of all the times to tune into the podcast, you get spoiled for the movie you're scenes. actually watching at that moment. <laughs> How does that even happen? That's so funny. I'm sorry. <laughs> I I feel so bad. I am so sorry, Tolkien girl. And you know what? Barf was so much cooler than Chewbacca. Yes. I'm sorry, John Candy. He was great. John Candy was a was a legend. Yes. Uh, Furry legend. Uh, yeah. So so anyway, like so we'll we'll move on from spoilers into another story. Next on our list. The next on the list is the picture of Dorian Gray by Oscar Wilde. And uh, Oscar Wilde is more known for his witty plays of social commentary, which this absolutely is. It's a witty novel of social commentary. Well, I okay. Well, not I, so much. It, I, would less say, wit. I would say Obvious like the wit. first half of it is definitely like witty social satire because you've got <laughs> Harold Hunt, he's like heaps coals of guilt on Josh's head. I feel terrible <laughs> of all the things to ruin. <laughs> but okay, so we're moving away from spoilers and into Dorian Gray. Um, so, and again, Dorian Gray has... Um, there's a certain um, there. There's a certain aspect of Dorian Gray that most people have gotten wrong in uh, later incarnations, but we'll get into that because it's kind of how the story ends. Um, so the basic premise is um, you have this uh, kid, Dorian Gray, who is just like young, beautiful, complete blank slate, innocent kid. Well who, off, right? Well off gets swept into decadent high society and um, he becomes the object of obsession by this one artist whose name escapes me at the moment. No, it's probably not important. Uh, 
he he's the artist who draws the picture. Yeah, I don't remember it either. <laughs> like, I, I think his name was Basil. Um, yeah, nothing. Yeah, yeah I remember. <laughs> yeah, okay. Um, um, but wait, doesn't he... Um, but it, he becomes obsessed with Dorian. Yeah, well, Dorian's still young and beautiful. He's still young and beautiful, and, and, he, and he paints this incredibly detailed picture of Dorian, this incredibly detailed portrait. A portrait that people are really impressed with. Yeah, and he just puts his all into it. And <laughs> and meanwhile, uh, Dorian um, takes up with this other guy, uh, Lord Henry, I think is his name. Sounds about right. Um, who basically is like the most cynical jerk you can possibly imagine. Like this, this is that guy who you meet at parties who has nothing but a, who, who exists only to make snarky comments on everything you say. Yeah, those are people I'm not friends with anymore. Yeah, that yeah. that's this guy. Like he is cynical. He has this, this incredibly like, stuffy superior attitude towards everyone and everything. Um, Whenever there's any sort of philosophical discussion, he will immediately take a contrarian perspective. Like, he, he's a complete jerk. And Dorian becomes fascinated with him. And, and anyway, like, so Basil gives Dorian the portrait. Um, Meanwhile, Dorian, with his new companionship, has been changing his lifestyle somewhat. Yeah, he he's go he's becoming part of this very decadent lifestyle, and entourage. Yeah, I'm trying to think of you. Pretty much, that's what my much. whole job is like trying to think of modern analogies. And oh, <laughs> Tolkien girl was saying, "I have seen all of Star Wars." You you made me feel so bad. Whatever. What they twist. <laughs> Man. Well played, Tolkien girl. Well played. <laughs> yeah, seriously. I was like, there is no way that she was just about to sit down nice to watch really totally Empire Strikes Back really for the first you. time and we spoiled it <laughs> and we believed you. That's because we are genuine, honest people here. Okay, let's get to the horror part of Dorian Gray. Okay, because. So yeah. it's not just that he becomes a spoiled brat. No, because uh, the, fir the first half of Dorian Gray, Gray is just really biting commentary like just incredibly biting satire on society which is of course nothing new that's what Oscar Wilde was known for um, but we see Dorian getting swept up into this very decadent uh, socialite lifestyle and he he takes up with a he does take up with um, an actress who he falls madly in love with and he wants to marry her, and she becomes totally enamored with him. And we actually looked this up. Um, it turns out that this is the origin of the term Prince Charming. Dun, dun, dun. Um, first official time it the, was ever used. The first official use of the term Prince Charming was uh, this actress's nickname for Dorian Gray. No, that makes the movie make more sense now. Just right? Too. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like, okay, now I get it. <laughs> because, yeah, explain why that Prince Charming is important. Well, um, it's basically used as evidence uh, later on, because um, what, happen what happens uh, between um, Dorian and uh, the actress is... Uh, oh, It doesn't turn out well. Tolkien Girl gives us a hug. Thank you, Tolkien Girl. You're, you're good. We're all good. <laughs> um, it, it doesn't turn out well, because she, she gives up... She basically gives up her acting ambition and turns in this absolutely wretched performance that Dorian and all of his friends uh, see. And, and Dorian, who has basically fallen in love with her for her acting, is so disgusted by this that he basically breaks off the engagement with her like right after the show. And, and so she, uh, and she ultimately kills herself. Yep. And this is when Is that the catalyst? That that's when that's when he notices. That's when he starts looking at that painting a little more closely. Mm -hmm. Or cuz I remember I, I, 
I, he's hey, I stole the one ring and saying, wait, I wasn't paying attention. Can you start over? No. Only if you give me a bathroom break. Right. Yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, we're, we're a little too deep into it. Basically, uh, Dorian has... Dorian has a portion of himself. Um, he falls in love with an actress. She falls in love with him. She uh, she gives up acting for him. He doesn't like it. He breaks up with her. She kills herself. Um, and things just go downhill from there. And that's when... Um, oh, Tolkien Girl now needs to leave to do her homework. Okay. Goodbye, Tolkien Girl. Uh, whatever you miss, this will be up on YouTube in a little while. So you can watch at your leisure. Um... So, um, so, so he enters so this different lifestyle he, after her death he of decadence. He, he and enters this, yeah, yeah, and it's after uh, the actress kills herself that he notices that his portrait is starting to age, and it's starting to get wrinkles. And basically, what it's doing is it's taking on the weight of his sin. But he looks great. Mm -hmm. But he still continues to look fantastic. He doesn't age. His yeah. portrait just gets older and uglier and creepier and, and more and, reflective of his internal. Yeah. And so there's a point where, like, uh, I'm, I'm going to... And Temple is saying it's all opium dens for Dorian. And that's <laughs> absolutely true. He does... Opium he do dens and whores. <laughs> he, he definitely, like, starts a downward spiral after he realizes this. So he... He takes advantage of it. No, he absolutely does. He uh, his permission. he takes a he takes the portrait, puts it up in an attic, covers it, and and hides it from sight from everybody. Which doesn't work because it was a very famous picture, and it, everybody it was a it was a beautiful picture. What did you do with your portrait, Dorian? What, what did you do with the portrait? And people ask him, and he's like, "Oh, I I sold it," or he like makes some vague excuse. And Meanwhile, wow, you haven't aged a bit. What has it been? Twenty years? No, yeah, grace? It's like wow. what is what is your secret, Dorian? But. As, <laughs> And finally, like, after a while, like, after he has, like, gone through, like, just absolute, like, decadence with opium, with horrors, with everything. Basically, he yeah. finally He finally well, catches up with the artist again and, and takes him and basically says, what did you do when you were painting this portrait of me? And he's like, I was just obsessed with you. I didn't do anything. And so then Dorian takes him up and shows him the portrait and shows him what's been going on. And... Basil, the artist, of course, freaks out. And he's like, we we need to do something. You need to accept your sin. You need to you need to uh, you need to cleanse yourself of all of this. And he's like, we can get through this, we can help this. And then Dorian straight up murders him. Well, yeah, because ba Basil looks at it as a is an evil, a moral thing, and Dorian at oh, this yeah. point is Kim Kardashian after all of her surgeries and yeah. doesn't want to go back. And, uh, obviously, and so uh, and so Dorian kills the guy, and we have a new uh, we have a new person here, Luana Greenleaf. Hello, Luana, welcome. So, um, was it? so he kills somebody. He he kills the artist, and and then covers it up and basically makes it look like he just disappeared while like out on a museum tour, and. And then time goes on, and then we see uh, the brother of the girl who killed herself originally. Yeah. He he is looking for Dorian because he blames him for her suicide, and and what he and the thing that triggers it is he see he f sees him in a bar, and or he sees him in a pub, and and he hears um, a prostitute call Dorian Prince Charming. Which is the big tell, because up until this point, Prince Charming is not a nickname you really use very often, or ever. And when this guy's sister talked about her boyfriend... She never she never called him Dorian. She never called him my name. She always called him Prince Charming. And, yeah, and I remember seeing the movie and reading the book and thinking, that's not uncommon, but yeah, at and, the time... And, reading, I was, and I was I was feeling that way, too, because, like, when she was calling him Prince Charming, like... They were like, all acting like this was such a unique and yeah. weird nickname. And I'm like, how is this a weird nickname? We grew up nickname? in Disney yeah. era, so... <laughs> yeah. And so, but this is this is the tip-off for the brother that this guy is called this Prince is Charming. Guy, yeah. This must be the guy. And so he confronts him. 
And that's when Dorian says, well, that was 18 years ago. I would have been a kid because, like, he still looks the same way he did 18 years ago. And so it obviously couldn't be me. <laughs> and, and so then the brother gives up and goes on. But then, like, he, he starts uh, investigating more and learns that this guy, Dorian Gray, has basically looked the same for the last 18, 20 years. Yeah. And that's when, that's when he's like, "Oh my God, this is the this is the man who uh, really? induced my sister yeah. to suicide." And Ava is saying Elijah Wood joked that he has a painting of himself in his attic. Quite true. He hasn't aged much. It's creepy. In the last uh, ten years or so. I, is that why I'm creeped out by people who don't age enough because of Dorian Gray? Like Johnny Depp. Yeah. yeah. Well, no, I just think he's he smoked so many cigarettes and drunk so much alcohol, he's actually perver preserved his skin. Oh, okay. Yeah. You know, like tanned it kind of. Yeah. Yeah. Not like, you know, in the sun, but like a hide. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so then ba basically it all comes to a point where like, and this is, this is the point where like, I just really absolutely was like, like, I know I don't, I shouldn't condone murder, but if Dorian were to kill Lord Henry, I'd be totally okay with it. Because there comes a point where uh, Dorian and Lord Henry are out on a hunt. And they they think they hear something in the brush. And basically, they one of the guys they're on the hunt with ultimately ends up accidentally shooting a guy and killing him. And Lord Henry acts like this is the biggest inconvenience in the world. He's like, ugh, we killed somebody? Oh, now we can't do anything. and Nobody will shut up about it. What is this? And I'm like, are you human? What is wrong with you? Yeah, that's... <laughs> like, I, I could not stand this character. Like, and I, I assume, like, there is... That's part of the reason, like, that's part of... Wilde's intention was to create this absolutely loathsome socialite character who basically does nothing except influence Dorian in awful, awful ways. Well, we need to feel some sympathy for Dorian in the beginning. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, we do need some sort of... And, but ultimately they discover, or Dorian discovers that this, uh, this guy who's been killed was actually the brother coming back to seek his revenge. And so it works out great for Dorian. Yeah, it worked out great for him, but like he's like really racked with guilt over this. And he's like basically all the weight of the sin is catching up with him. And this is this is where the common misconception of Dorian Gray comes into play. Um, like if you've seen like anything like uh, League of Extraordinary Gentlemen. <laughs> um the, com the common perception of Dorian Gray is that if he looks at the portrait, yeah. every everything comes back to him. He can't look at it himself. He can't look at it, which is not the case in in the... Otherwise, he never would have found out that... Yeah, you it, it's, not, it's not the case <laughs> in the story at all. He, he spends days staring at this thing. And I think that has a lot to do with it, too. I think yeah. he literally, you know, yeah, pouring he, his soul he, into it. He becomes it. obsessed with this thing. And he shows it to other people. He shows it to the artist, and that doesn't, and that doesn't do it. What ultimately does it is when he tries to destroy the painting. Like this is when he has basically finally just reached his wit's end. Um, he uh, there there was something. He had slipped up somehow, and basically he knew the cops were coming for him. Yeah. Um, and I forget how. Um, so he's basically sort of processing all of this in his head, and he knows the end is soon. And he's like, it's all because of this damn painting. And so he goes up to the attic, takes a knife to it, and then the last scene, the last mm -hmm. scene is the police going into Dorian's home because they heard a scream. Wait, should you stop now? Spoilers. Yeah, I guess. And... Well, I, we already go too far. We, we, we're already there. <laughs> um, so, so they go in and they find the painting is destroyed, and next to it is a decrepit, decomposed, brutally ugly, gross old body. Yeah. And it's only from the jewelry on his hands that they realize that this horrible 
disgusting creature is actually uh, Dorian Gray. And the League of Extraordinary Gentlemen really, 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 just really, really killed that one for me. Because it got everything it, wrong. It got everything wrong, and I mean, the continuity alone was just amazingly bad. But yeah. that and whole, I, I blame, that I blame whole, the movie. I do not blame the yeah, comics. The no, comics no, no, are much no, better. Course. The whole, the whole, you know, I'm Dorian Gray. As long as I have this painting, I can never die. Yeah. Um, I'm sorry. If you got shot full of bullets like that, I think he would have died. No, like there. Do you there, think the painting would have magically started? No, there, there was bullets? nothing in the book that that, right. that said he was invincible. Nothing. Just that he wasn't aging. And and basically, the the thing that the the horror is that by being a horrible person, you you are you're killing your soul. You're just being. He just became evil. Yeah. So. And and that's really like what this story is about. It's about um, it's about your your own sin and your own um, your own decadence. And when you remove that, just how far will you go when you realize that you no longer have the weight of sin on you? So all we need to do really is um, hunt down the portraits of Paris Hilton, mm -hmm. Kim Kardashian. Well, all the Kardashians. Let's just get all of them. Yeah. Um, and then we don't have to deal with them anymore. Apparently. Yeah. Because that's really, I mean, Dorian, his actual character, he was a, yeah, he was a socialite. Yeah, he was a socialite. And he was he just was, a playboy. And he was completely self-involved. Yeah. And, and which, he killed which is Angela Lansbury. Yes, he did. In the movie version, which I think was unique because it's in black and white except for shots of the painting, which is in color. Interesting. Yeah. And it gets very gruesome. I would imagine so because yeah the the um, the murder of Basil in the book is very brutal like it it's very brutal and very gruesome. Yeah, I think he kind of used what was at hand, didn't he? Uh, he uh, he basically like I, he takes a knife and basically just stabs him in the head yeah. over and over and over again. So, but it's like they're. But there's like this scene where like he first does it and, and you know, it's like, it's, it's that kind of scene where like you have the person committing murder for the first time and they like do the act, but the person isn't quite dead. So they're struggling and the murderer is sitting there sort of in shock because they know what yeah. they've done, but they also know that they can't go back. They need to finish the job. Yeah. And so like, he, there's like that struggle and like that, that's this scene. And it's like, it, it's really rough. Like it's it's rough stuff. And um, Dorian Gray like and I I probably emphasize this stuff way too much just because I teach kids who don't like reading, but like um, like Jekyll and Hyde is a shorter mm -hmm. novel, yeah. um, which I like because I don't think you could drag that on. Not really. For, I, I, Twenty I, years is, is yeah. Pretty I sort of feel like it. <laughs> I feel like the pacing was a little slow, but that's more a product of its time than anything else. Exactly. And I think, yeah, with something like that, the pacing would be slow because we are talking to we the whole point is the span of time. Yeah. Yeah. Is what turns it into something supernatural. All right. So we got one story left to go, one book left to go, and we saved <laughs> we saved the best for latest and last. We, we, I'll, yeah, I'll, just every, everybody's Christmas, on board with your idea of buying down the Yeah. All we have, mm -hmm. Yeah. You never know. Um, See, the last one is Dave LaChapelle. Someone hunt him down. <laughs> yeah. So, and the last, uh, the last story, the or the last classic horror story that we're going to talk about. It's I know the most recent. And I know that there are plenty of other classic horror stories yes. that we weren't able to cover, but we only have so much time, and there are um, way too many. <laughs> there are far too many. So we're kind of going with like the big novels. Some some of the some of the better ones, some of the greats. Um, and I know that there are many others that I didn't touch on that I wish I could have. But um, for this last one, we're going to be talking about that late, great, awesome book that inspired everybody everywhere. Yeah. Dracula by Bram Stoker. Whose full name was Abraham. Ooh. Just like Van Helsing. Abraham Whoa. Van Helsing. Whoa, I just got no, that. No, you have to say it like the Anthony Hopkins way. Abraham Van Helsing. Abraham Van Helsing. <laughs> or wait, what's the Hugh Jackman way? Okay. No, 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 no. Oh, talk about 
talk about ruining classics. Uh, Dracula. Now, I read Dracula in high school or junior high school. Um, I think it was high school for me. And uh, Bram Stoker's Dracula came out in 1992. Yeah, I know I read it before uh, the movie came out. And um, when the movie came out, I was too young to see it. So I know for a fact I read the novel before I saw the movie. And at the time, as a kid, I was impressed with the fact that they, unlike other Dracula experiences I had had, this was, that one is the one that followed the novel the closest. It did, but it also took its it own also, liberties. Yeah, and I... The movie wouldn't have gotten made without Winona Ryder, so we were in yeah. for it with her, but yeah. yeah. My friend and I used to quote Keanu from that movie. <laughs> it's the man himself, yeah. whoa! He's grown young! He's grown young! Oh my god, Keanu! <laughs> I love oh, you, Keanu. Oh, I love Keanu. you, Keanu, but you are a horrible Jonathan Harker. Oh, you are a horrible any classic thing. Do you remember Dangerous Liaisons? Oh. 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 I will fight you! <laughs> Oh, I, I, I don't want to disrespect <laughs> Keanu too much because, you don't. because there's going to be a Bill and Ted 3, and I love that. Well, that's Keanu being Keanu. I think. Exactly. But the <laughs> fact that he wants to do it is, the fact that he's still on board and wants to do it is like, you know what, Keanu, he, you can do whatever other crap yeah, you I want to Keanu in your life. Yeah, I think just decided, but, I don't care who the show you want. But you know what, we're, we're doing Bill and Ted 3, and I'm totally okay with that. I am so... <laughs> Not okay with that. I am. I am one hundred percent okay. Anyway. With that. Anyway. Dracula. Um, that framing device for Dracula, which surprised me because I wasn't expecting it, was that um, it was newspaper articles and it, letters, and jewel, journal entries. Yeah. Um, um, the journal and all entries. from different characters. And, and some of the characters were not characters in the story. Like one, there was a newspaper article on how there was a shipwreck and then this large dog was seen. Run and yeah. so we know that it's Dracula mm -hmm. doing his thing, but um, it's very, it was very unique and very clever. It, it was that like, way. And, and the way I always describe it is like it's a 19th century version of a found footage book. Yeah, found yeah, footage definitely, book. definitely. Um, um, but. What I found so interesting is like while you have all these different disparate elements, like you'll you'll read in one part will be a newspaper article, the next yeah. will be a journal entry, the next will be like part of Mina's diary, and then you'll have you'll She's have She's not like, as hateable in the book. She's like And then you'll have like patient logs from Doctor Seward in the next chapter. And, yeah. Or you'll have like you'll have notes from a student um listening to a lecture given by Professor Van Helsing. It really, it, it's, oh, yeah, that's a great, that's it, it, really great It's analogy all over there. the place, yeah. but yet it all strings together in, like, this incredibly yeah. well-told story. And and there are, there are just some extreme differences between the novel and any adaptation. And yeah. the one that, that struck me the most is Dracula has a mustache. Yes, he does. Dracula has a mustache. He also mm -hmm. has a unibrow and is incredibly ugly, but he has a mustache in that it really in, threw me. Yeah, in, in the book. I was book. not and, ready for that. And there, I actually have a, a version of it. It's probably back east, mm -hmm. but I have an illustrated version of Dracula, and oh, the illustrations right. are based on the text. The descriptions of the And based text. on the yeah. description. And so the images of Dracula That's in weird. that are very different from what you see on the screen. And... and yeah. Like, I would say probably the closest we've gotten to the actual description in the book is the Gary Oldman version. Yeah, and and oh gosh, what's the name of the costume designer for that? Oh god, She's I can't remember. Brilliant. She won an Oscar for it. Um, the Japanese lady. Yes. I, I can't know. remember, but that the makeup and the costumes for that, I mean, again, I, I have to say, Winona Ryder is the one who found the script, and that's yeah. why they made it, but... Mm -hmm. There were some things in there that really were the closest to, mm -hmm. but even even as old Dracula, when Jonathan Harker comes to the pal you know his yeah. castle for the first time to yeah. do his taxes, yeah. Um, even Gary Oldman, he, he didn't have a mustache, okay? He didn't no, have a mustache. He didn't have a mustache. He looked like Airport Palpatine. But, but, he, but was, he was old and decrepit. He was which disgusting. Is, yeah. The, the, I remember the fingernails and everything. Yeah, the creepy and, fingernails and the oh, shadows. The, sh that, oh, the shadows that, that, so that are doing cool. different things. Yeah. And that was that captured the spirit of the novel, which 
I, yeah. Another thing that's disappointed now, me was, like most classic fiction, it was understated. Yeah, and and here's here's the thing that I I really don't <laughs> like. And uh, uh -huh. what is it? What is I'm not telling Dracula he can't shoot. Yeah, everybody says shit. Dracula uh -huh. can rock a mustache if he wants to. Who's gonna tell him it hey, looks bad? and you know what? Anyway? Wait, but 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 you know, in modern vampire fiction, most vampires can't grow facial hair. I know. Ooh. Which is I wonder what's up with that. Ooh. Jack well, looked, I don't think he had a beard. Well the, just this, the this, this goes this goes again with like all the different vampire tropes that apparently yeah. started with Dracula, but were not part of Dracula, but were sort sort of morphed over time. Uh, the big one being sunlight. And, and yeah, actually And in, in Dracula not in, a problem. in the book, he can he can go out in the sun. He's not as powerful when yeah. he goes out in the sun, but he can still do it. And, and, and of course, like that's where you get the famous, it's the man himself. He he's looked, grown young. he's grown young. I would never have recognized him. For God's sakes, he's wearing t-shirts. No, he's got he, sunglasses on. He did not look anything ever. like never. that vampire. Oh, God, that was, that was, oh. And, and then when Nona, Jonathan, oh, oh, <laughs> like trying to go. <laughs> and Erebondi says, at least Dracula didn't sparkle. And yes, that's true. There is that. Thank God, right? But, but it's, um, the other thing is uh, the stake through the heart. Um, and That's just part of it. It's just part of it. Yeah, you gotta like, do the whole thing. Because like, what we see, like particularly in Buffy the Vampire Slayer, if you if you stake them through the heart, that's enough to kill them. That's... And make them dissipate so you don't get in trouble for corpses. Yeah. And that... I found that too convenient. And that's... Uh, <laughs> that... And Ava is saying, everyone remember that Buffy episode with Dracula. So funny. I loved that episode. I did not like that episode at I all. I thought it was hilarious. I, I thought the Xander stuff was faintly amusing because Renfields are always amusing. Yeah. But I really like Dracula. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And and all these... Oh, God, there's a new Dracula coming out that's about Dra like historical Dracula. Dracula oh Untold. Oh, oh, my God. Starring Luke Evans, Bard from The Hobbit. So there we go. Actually, Dracula, now we've got two uh, Lord of the Rings connections. Uh, Dracula Untold stars yeah. Luke Evans. And, of course, one of the one of the famous classic Draculas was Christopher Lee. Well, yes. And several times. Many, many times, yeah. Yeah. Um, and who I would say is still to this day one of the scarier Draculas he there's looks, ever been. He, he has the right face. Dracula is supposed to have these very, you know, uh, well, okay, Slavic here, facial features. He's, yeah. he's got a very specific face. Yeah, well, here, here was my problem with um, many of the adaptations of Dracula and sort of how this, uh, this evolved over years is that Dracula sort of becomes a romantic lead. Yes. And particularly in uh, the Gary Oldman version. Oh yeah, that was completely. Like, that was the all, huge tap. All of that historical it. stuff. None of that is in the book. No. Um, and nothing. And Stoker was just inspired. I stole one ring and saying, game. "I'm going to see that Dracula movie." Don't judge. I don't judge. Not judging. I'm not. I'm not judging. Like I actually kind of want to see it too, just for the ridiculousness of it. I. It looks cool, but because I am like. One of those people who's like, no, that's wrong. <laughs> um, I, I just, I can't do it. And also, I, I, there was a point where I read a lot about Dracula because I was like, okay, so yeah. there was a Dracula. Let's read about him. No, there is no connection. There is no vampiric thing. Anything. The worst, well, the most entertaining thing the original Dracula did was um, when some Muslim ambassadors came to his court and wouldn't remove their headgear. Yeah. Uh, he nailed it to their heads. Yeah. 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 Um. That's about so, it. So anyway, the other yeah. trope that I was talking about was the stake through the heart, um, which is part, part of it. It's the first part of a two-part way that you kill a vampire. I, I would consider it a three-part way, because don't you have to stuff the mouth with garlic? Yeah, that's true. So, for, <laughs> so first of all, the stake through the heart is really to make sure that they stay in the Yeah, grave. that's just to keep them that, down. That's to keep them it's down. It's not to destroy the heart at all. It, it's just to keep them where they are, because like... It doesn't have to be the heart. It just has it, to. It just has to be in there somewhere. Yeah, so, just stick them down so they can't wiggle away. And then the next part is <laughs> stuff the mouth with garlic, and then decapitate them. You have to decapitate them, and in Bram Stoker's Dracula, they very they dramatically do it, they do it right. Where <laughs> oh god, that with, costume! With Lucy, oh god, that that costume and <laughs> just just the amount oh. of blood in that scene. And that her head doesn't it just kind of like span and blood. <laughs> It, it, all, all I remember is like he he takes a stake, one hammer pound, and just 
gouts of blood flying everywhere. <laughs> That's right. Oh God, I'm remembering and, like all those, all of the characters. And then like from at, that after that whole thing, the book. and the thing I love about those that scene, friends. the thing I love about that whole scene Which is uh, the staking, killing of Lucy scene. After he's done all that, they're covered in blood. He take he takes the machete, chops off the head, smash cut to somebody ch cutting into prime. Yeah, rib. yeah. <laughs> Dracula and me now on their date. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Yeah, and then he does the whole absence speech thing, not in. <laughs> yeah. in in the in the book, Dracula symbolizes vampire vampirism symbolizes, you know, STDs, really it does, but oh. Dracula isn't sexy. No. It's not because Dracula STDs is not sexy aren't at all. sexy. They're yeah. they're what's not sexy about sex. So No, vampires are monsters. Yeah, so and, and, and Nosferatu got that, right? Nosferatu is like one of okay, like I take it back. When I said Christopher Lee was like one of the best on screen drag or like the best on screen drag. Matt Shrek was. Matt Shrek. Matt Shrek nailed it. And Christopher Lee is fantastic. I don't want to take anything away from Christopher Lee. He was amazing. But Matt Shrek, Nosferatu, one of the creepiest, most insane adaptations of Dracula you will ever see. Um, did you ever see that movie with Carrie Elway's that's about the making of it? Oh, yeah. And Shadow how he's, like, vampire. really a vampire? Yeah. yeah. Uh, it was Willem Dafoe who was playing him, right? I think, yes. Yeah. Yes, it was. Yeah. I never saw that one. I do need to check it out. I did see that because I, lo I love that idea because the, mm -hmm. um, Anna Nosferatu, which was a German, a, an illegal German adaptation of Dracula. Yeah. Um, you know, no, Dracula doesn't look like a bunny either. Yeah. But it was still, that was the creepiest, most monstrous representation yeah. we got. And it then, was absolutely just And then we get Bella Lugosi, who's wearing a Star of David for some reason. Yeah. I still am like, what is up with that? I really don't know. I, I still don't get that. But, you know, and, you know, when I saw the Todd Browning's movie, I was disappointed, too. It was so dull. The, that's... The Bela Lugosi. Movie. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it was it was not a good movie, but like it it was again it was a movie that captivated audiences. And it changed the vampire lore because, in you know, it's all about limitations. Yeah, they had bats. Yeah, Dracula could turn into a bat because they could do that. Yeah, but and, other but, animals. No. But in, in the book, uh, Dracula could turn into a bat. He could turn rats. into a wolf. He could turn into rats. He could turn into mist. Yeah, creepy crawly mist. Mm -hmm. Yeah, basically. You're you're screwed. You're not going to be Dracula. Yeah, no, Dracula was a pretty invincible character. And how? Like it. it and took, if you do defeat him, a, you're going to end up a broken human being. Yeah, it took a lot for them <laughs> yeah. to finally beat him. And and the book spans like years, really. Yeah, yeah, many many years. Which gives um, which would explain how Keanu's hair went so gray. Yeah. All of a sudden. Well, I mean, part of it. Well. <laughs> well, <laughs> well there was also the fright factor of like being his prisoner for so yes, long. Yes, but we all do know that the hair that's already grown can't magically turn white, yes, right? Okay, yes. just checking. Yeah, checking. I know I'm growing in some great white hairs now, but you know it takes time. Mm -hmm. um, oh god, yep. yeah, that cracks me up. Yeah. Well, all of a sudden we see him and he's like baby powder through the wig thing. And I, I felt so bad for him because it was such a bad white job. <laughs> it was really. It, it looked there like high school so, theater. It was so sad. That movie was really, there was a lot of really amazing, really well done stuff and a lot of really cruddy stuff. And it was a soap opera. Do you know who wrote it? Um, the movie? Yeah. Because mm. cause I do. And no, I don't. He, and he wrote something else that a lot of us really love. No, I don't. The screenwriter is James V. Hart. And okay. he's the one who came up with the whole idea to adapt it. And he is also the writer of Hook. No way. Way. Yeah. So. Wow. Yeah. That like really made, and it, that kind of made sense to me. Romanticizes stuff. Yeah. A lot. Yeah. But. Because like, um, in, in, a, in the book, there is no romantic connection between no. Dracula and Mina. There is, however. There's, there's a there, there, sexual there, connection. There is definitely uh, an attraction and I would say even an obsession. But it's not, it, She's there's no love. That, there's that there's no love. There's, yes, about there's no whole thing with, like, with like her and... resembling his long lost wife. Yeah, whatever. No, that's not. That's Dracula not doesn't even get a backstory in the novel. No, Dracula just like 
he's just and, there. And that's that's what makes him so scary. Is like he yeah. is he is a monster. He is he is a force of nature. And like that's like you're it's like the Joker me, in Batman. Yeah, you're reminding me of other things that you know. There's so much. Bram Stoker wrote so much vampire lore mm -hmm. that people haven't kept up. Like um, I remember when Harker is going to Dracula's castle on the stagecoach. The coach driver, who he thinks is Dracula, mm -hmm. will stop the coach every few miles and when he sees these blue fires and they're being followed by wolves, like there's yeah. all this really supernatural stuff that goes yeah. on. Um, oh yeah, and there's that scene where a village woman comes and is like begging for her baby. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, um, which, which kind of leads into uh, how I wanted to end the show. <laughs> um, so Temple is saying it's kind of a commentary on women's sexuality and trying to scare girls into being pure. pure. I, I would hope that it would scare men too, but yeah, yeah, I think the fact that the main vampire, Dracula has his brides, but they don't leave the castle. No. They're not really the threat that he is. He no. His whole thing is he's going out into the world to... Yeah, uh, they're, they're a out. threat to uh, Jonathan. Yes. Because um, uh, they're the ones who are keeping him weak. Now that was an interesting scene. Yeah. <laughs> I don't think I was emotionally mature enough for that. No, I, I definitely wasn't. <laughs> and I went to see that movie with my parents. Oh! Oh! Oh, God, that's worse than Moonlighting. That, that's I awkward. Moonlighting was bad. That's that awkward. is awkward. <laughs> oh, jeez. Um, it's a good thing they cut Winona's topless scene, then. Yeah. I, I would not have been ready for that. Ron Stoker would have... Uh, he probably would have had a little heart attack. If... Mm -hmm. I mean, he'd probably be okay with the Bella Lugosi one, but... The stuff Maybe. we do now. But mm. again, like um, with Dracula and with uh, Frankenstein, I feel like these classic universal versions of it are not. They they very much oversimplify the oh, stories. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And, and to their credit, they work. Like they definitely like made an impact because very we iconic. still like them to this day. And what's interesting is I've heard that uh, this new Dracula Untold is apparently supposed to be the start of Universal rebooting the classic monsters. Oh god. That means... But in that in this new unique way. Which I'm like, okay, does that mean that they're Wait, gonna... what about the wolf? Didn't they try the Wolfman with Benicio Del Toro? Yeah, what that happened? Did, that did I not thought work that well. was a reboot. That did not work well. Yeah, because it's the freaking Wolfman. The Wolfman is... The Wolfman is unique. I uh, the Wolfman. Yeah. Werewolves are scary. I was terrified of them as a kid. Yeah, to totally understandable. Um, I blame Jonathan Landis. If, if you want to... Oh, yeah. Oh, God. American Werewolf in London. Oh, Ooh, my Lord. God. Isn't oh, that... God. A, it's so great. That, that movie <laughs> still creeps me out to this day. And you know what? That's actually something to bring up, too. There's no classic novel with a werewolf. For the Wolfman, yeah. Yeah, that, that's, that's that, an interesting point. That that's true. That's true. It's just kind of thrown in there. But, um... Fan of the Opera's a novel. Yeah, and that's a, that's another one that we weren't able to talk about this week. And that, by the way, is so... The novel is so much more intensely complicated than yeah. any version you've probably seen. Unless it really you've seen is. the, the Lon Chaney black and white version covers a lot of it. The Lon Chaney version is probably the closest. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, unfortunately... And that's all the traps. Unfortunately, things. like, it's been a long time since I read it, and I, did, I wasn't able to do a reread, but... No, I haven't read it since I was... I was in high school when I read yeah, it. Yeah, I was going to say, I haven't read it since maybe junior high, when I was really into the Phantom of the Opera. Yeah. Um, but, um, but anyway, yeah. uh, like, so bringing it back to uh, Dracula. Um, Dracula. Uh, and, of course, there's the, uh, the whole idea now that they have found Dracula's tomb somewhere in Italy. Oh, who the... Which what? Is, Wait, which is Italy? such BS. Italy. <laughs> Yeah. Okay, so, wait. This is some uh, Da Vinci Code crap. <laughs> yeah, I'm sorry. Um, maybe Romania, but not Italy. And not even Transylvania, by the way. No, no, he was a, he was Moldavian. Yeah. Um, <laughs> like Vigo? Yes. <laughs> Scottish. No, 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 no. <laughs> Vigo was Carpathian. Carpathia. Carpathia. <laughs> yeah. Um, Which I was like, aren't the Carpathians a mountain range? Yes. <laughs> And well, all of that, that whole. Yeah. Oh, that's right. Part part of his name was the Sorrow of Moldavia. Yeah. So it's a, it, it, it's, it's all okay. it's it all these tiny little kingdoms, and mm -hmm. apparently my grandmother, my, my dad's side, grandmother's family is from there. Mm -hmm. But so, but yeah, had like, werewolves in the family. Who knows? Ooh. Jewish werewolves. Ooh. 
Wait. Maybe you're related to Queen Victoria. Then what do they do on the Sabbath? <laughs> <laughs> it's an interesting night. I do not want to be related to Queen Victoria no. because that would mean I'd be like related to all of that extreme inbreeding. And, yeah. Yeah. No. No. It's okay. I can. Uh, I can deal with not being that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um. So. Uh, so wrapping up with uh, Dracula, I want to talk about. One thing that I discovered in my research, and we were talking about this uh, last week a little bit, um, there was a collection of short stories that were by Bram Stoker that were published uh, posthumously in 1914. And uh, the, the title story in it is Dracula's Guest. And uh, we were talking about this a little bit because um, Kelly had brought it up. Um, as a, it was a story that focused on a wolf. And this was like, so she was like, so it can't be Dracula, but I've read it and it def it goes by a couple different names, but Dracula's Guest is uh, the most popular one. Question, is this the one that's like the mini story from the novel that covers Jonathan Parker visiting? Yeah. Yeah, that's Dracula. Yeah, yeah. Dracula yeah. can be a wolf, he can be a, yeah. anything. Yeah, Magic. so this is, uh, what this is, is actually, it's a deleted first chapter of Dracula that he took out because it was too redundant. Mm, which, which having read, I realized, like, everything that happens in this chapter, it's a very intense, cool chapter. Yeah. But basically all the information that you need happens later on when he meets up with the gypsies in Transylvania. Yeah, so you don't need it then. You don't, you don't need it then. The exposition later yeah, and, I, and I think, I think uh, what you get from the gypsies is actually a much better exposition because it's more direct this is more obscure yeah um <clears throat> but um it, it was still an interesting read and that's what i was going to bring into uh how we're going to end episodes this month with a dramatic reading mm -hmm. and so for those of you who are still around and who might be getting ready for bed if you're in that uh time zone <laughs> Uh, get ready, because uh, I'm going to be doing a dramatic reading of Dracula's Guest by Bram Stoker. It's a little long. This might take about 20 minutes or so. And I'm also probably going to put this up separately. Um, uh, we'll see. We'll see how this goes. So this is the first time I've done this in... I was going to read it from my uh, Kindle, but the battery's almost dead, so I'm going to read it from my computer, which is going to be different and weird. And I've got a... You got a skedaddle? I got a skedaddle. Okay. All right. Well, thank you, Rachel, for coming. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you for all your wonderful insight. Thank you so much for having me over. And, yeah. and next week, uh, we'll be discussing... Edgar Allan Poe and H.P. Lovecraft. Yes, which is why we didn't discuss them this week. Yes, because, because they are there's so, just too much. There is far too much with them. They really need an episode to themselves. Yeah, definitely. So that's going to be next week, and expect lots of craziness because once we get into Lovecraft, like brains are going to explode. That's pretty much that's Scanners pretty much what, type exploding. No, more like more in the. Uh, abstract sense. Oh, okay. Because, yeah, it'd be kind of hard to clean up. Yeah. Pop. Cherry. Yeah, but, yeah. Lovecraft is kind of mind-blowing. <laughs> and and also, kind of... uh, next Friday is uh, the opening night of Reanimator the Musical. Oh, that's yes. right. I'm going. Yeah, we're, I'm going, too. We're going to be there. Yes, opening night, which is Lovecraft. And, and which is adapted Lovecraft. It's adapted Lovecraft. Because... As we will talk about next week, Lovecraft had great ideas, but as far as his prose, it wasn't the most exciting prose on the planet. It's, yeah, there there are times where I'm like, this is really interesting, but he is a very long-winded writer. He liked using lots of words. Like, yeah. he, he, like he was one of those people who thought that... You know, I can prove how smart I am by using my words. Yeah. He also <laughs> makes up a lot of his own words. Yeah. Oh, look what Shakespeare did to us. Well, yeah. Okay. So All right. Well, take care. Thanks. I will. Good and luck. you tell a lovely story. Yes. Hopefully. Hopefully I won't screw this up too badly. No, I'm good. See you later. Okay. Bye. Okay. 
Uh, Eruvandi is saying, I've never understood what Cthulhu is supposed to be. Well then, tune in next week because we are going to be talking about Cthulhu. And we're going to tell you everything you need to know about Cthulhu. Um, Cthulhu is something, it's, it's hard to describe in like one sentence. Um, there's a lot that goes into it. Um, so yeah, tune in next week. We will, we will tell you all about it. We'll give you a good primer on Lovecraft and Cthulhu, along with all of the great um, Edgar Allan Poe stuff, which I hope many of you have read. If you haven't, I highly recommend checking it out. Okay, so it is now story time. So I'm going to be reading to you Dracula's Guest by Bram Stoker. And as I said, this is a deleted first chapter of Dracula. This was originally how Dracula was supposed to begin. <clears throat> when we started our drive, the sun was shining brightly on Munich, and the air was full of joyousness of early summer. Just as we were about to depart, Herr Delbruck, the master de hotel of the Quatre Saison, where I was staying, came down bareheaded to the carriage and after wishing me a pleasant drive said to the coachman still holding his hand on the handle of the carriage door remember you are back by nightfall the sky looks the sky looks bright but there is a shiver in the north that says the, that says there may be a sudden storm but i am sure you will not be late here he smiled and added for you know what night it is johann answered with an emphatic ja mein herr and touching his hat drove off quickly. When we had cleared the town, he said after signaling him to stop. I said after signaling him to stop. Tell me, Johann, what is tonight? He crossed himself as he answered laconically, Walpurg is not. Then he took out his watch, a great old-fashioned German silver thing as big as a turnip, and looked at it, with his eyebrows gathered together and a little impatient shrug of his shoulders. I realized that this was his way of respectfully protesting against the unnecessary delay and sank back into the carriage, merely motioning him to proceed. He started off rapidly as if to make up for lost time. Every now and then the horses seemed to throw up their heads and sniff the air suspiciously. On such occasions I often looked around in alarm. The road was pretty bleak, for we were traveling, we were traversing a sort of high windswept plateau. As we drove, I saw a road that looked but little used, and which seemed to dip through the through the little winding valley. It looked so inviting that, even at the risk of offending him, I called Johann to stop. And when he had pulled up, I told him I would like to drive down that road. He made all sorts of excuses and frequently crossed himself as he spoke. This somewhat piqued my curiosity, so I asked him various questions. He answered fencingly, repeated, repeatedly looked at his watch in protest. Finally, I said, well, Johann, I want to go down this road. I shall not ask you to come unless you, unless you like. But tell me, why do, you, why do you not like to go? That is all I ask. For answer, he seemed to throw himself off the box. So quickly did he reach the ground. Then he stretched out his hands appealingly to me and implored me not to go. There was just enough of English mixed with the German for me to understand the, the drift of his talk. He seemed always just about to tell me something, the very idea of which evidently frightened him. But each time he pulled himself together, he pulled himself up saying, Walpurg is not. I tried to argue with him, but it was difficult to argue with a man who did not know his language when I did not know his language. The advantage certainly rested with him, for although he began to speak in English, of a very crude and broken kind, he always got excited and broke into his native tongue, and every time he did so, he looked at his watch. Then the horses became restless and sniffed the air. At this he grew very pale, and, looking around in a frightened way, he suddenly jumped forward, took them by the bridles, and led them on, and led them on some twenty feet. I followed and asked him why he had done this. For an answer, he crossed himself, pointed to the spot we had left, and drew his carriage in the direction of the other road, indicating a cross. 
and said first in German and then in English. Buried him. Him what killed themselves. I remember the old custom of burying suicides at crossroads. Ah, I see. A suicide. How interesting. But for the life of me, I could not make out why the horses were frightened. Whilst we were talking, we heard a sort of sound between a yelp and a bark. It was far away, but the horses got very restless. It took Johann all his time to quiet them. He was pale and said, It sounds like a wolf, but yet there are no wolves here now. No, I said, questioning him. Isn't it long since the wolves were so near to the city? Long, long, he answered. In the spring and summer, but with the snow, the wolves have been here not so long. Whilst he was petting the horses and trying to quiet them down, dark clouds drifted rapidly across the city. The sunshine passed away and a breath of cold wind seemed to drift over us. It was only a breath, however, and more of a warning than a fact, for the sun came out brightly again. Johann looked under his Johann looked under his lifted hand at the horizon and said, This storm of snow, he comes before a long time. Then he looked at his watch again, and straight away, holding his reins firmly, for the horses were still pawing the ground restlessly and shaking their heads, he climbed onto his box as though the time had come for proceeding on our journey. I felt a little obstinate and did not at once get into the carriage. Tell me, I said, about this place where the road leads, and I pointed down. Again he crossed himself and mumbled a prayer before he answered, It is unholy. What is unholy? The village. Then there is a village. No, no. No one lives there hundreds of years. My curiosity was piqued. But you said there was a village. There was. Where is it now? Whereupon he burst into a long story in German and English, so mixed up that I could not quite understand exactly what he said. Roughly I gathered that long ago, hundreds of years, men had died there and been buried in their graves. But sounds were heard under the clay, and when the graves were opened, men and women were found rosy with life, with their mouths red with blood. And so, in haste to save their lives, I and their souls, and here he crossed himself, those who were left fled away to other places, where the living, where the living lived, and the dead were dead, and not, not something. He was evidently afraid to speak the last words. As he proceeded with his narration, he grew more and more excited. It seemed as if his imagination had got hold of him, and he ended in a perfect paroxysm of fear, white-faced, perspiring, trembling, and looking around him as if expecting that some dreadful presence would manifest itself there in the bright sunshine in the wide open plain. Finally, in an agony of desperation, he cried, Warburg is not! and pointed to the carriage for me to get in. Eh, oh, my English blood rose at this, and standing back I said, You are afraid, Johann, you are afraid. Go home. I shall return alone. The walk will do me good. The carriage door was open. I took from my seat my oak walking stick, which I always carry on my holiday excursions, and closed the door, pointing back to Munich, and said, Go home, Johann. Walpurgis knocked doesn't concern Englishmen. The horses were here. The horses were now more restive than ever, and Johann was trying to hold them in while excitedly imploring me not to do anything so foolish. I pitied the poor fellow. He was so deeply in earnest. But all the same, I could not help laughing. His English was quite gone now. In his anxiety, he had forgotten that his only means of making me understand was to talk my language. So he jabbered away in his native German. It began to be a little tedious. After giving the direction home, I turned to go down the cross road to the valley. With a despairing gesture, Johann turned his horses toward Munich. 
I leaned on my stick and looked after him. He went slowly along the road for a while, then came over the crest of the hill. He went slowly along the road for a while. Then there came over the crest of the hill a man, tall and thin. I could see so much in the distance. When he drew near the horses, they began to jump and kick about, then to scream with terror. Johann did not hold them in. They bolted down the road, running away madly. I watched them out of sight, then looked for the stranger, but I found that he, too, was gone. With a light heart, I turned down the side roads through the deepening valley to which Johann had objected. There was not the slightest reason that I could see for his objection, and I dare say I tramped for a couple of hours without thinking of some time or distance, and certainly without seeing a person or a house. So far, this, so far as this place was concerned, it was desolation itself. I did not notice the particular. I did not notice this particularly till, on turning a bend in the road, I came upon a scattered fringe of wood. Then I recognized I had been impressed unconsciously by the desolation of the region, of the region through which I had passed. I sat down to rest myself and began to look around. It struck me that it was considerably colder than it had been at the commencement of my walk. A sort of sighing sound seemed to be around me, now and then high overhead, a sort of muffled roar. Looking upwards, I noticed that great thick clouds were drafting rapidly across the sky from north to south at a great height. There were signs of a coming storm in some lofty stratum of the air. I was a little chilly, and thinking that it was that it was sitting still after the exercise of walking, I resumed my journey. The ground I passed over was now much more picturesque. There were no striking objects that the eye might single out. But there was a charm of beauty. I took, the, I took little heed of time, and it was only when the deepening twilight forced itself upon me that I began to think how I should find my way home. The air was cold, and the drifting clouds high overhead was more marked. They were accompanied by a sort of faraway rushing sound, through which seemed to come at intervals that mysterious cry which the driver had said came from a wolf. For a while I hesitated. I had said that I, that I would see the deserted village, so on I went presently, and came on a wide stretch of open country shut, shut in by hills all around. Their sides were covered with trees which spread down the plain, dotting in clumps the gentlest slopes and hollows which showed there. I followed with my eyes the winding of the road and saw that it curved close to one of the densest of those clumps and was lost behind it. As I looked there came a cold shiver in the air and the snow began to fall. I thought of the miles and miles of bleak country I had passed and hurried to seek shelter of the wood in front. Darker and darker grew the sky, and faster and heavier fell the snow, till the earth before and around me was a glistening white carpet, the further edge of which was lost in misty vagueness. The road was here, but crude, and when on this level its boundaries were not so marked as when I passed, as when it passed through the cuttings. And in, a, and in a little while I found that I must be, I must have strayed from it, or I missed underfoot the hard surfaces, and my feet sank deeper in the grass and moss. Then the wind grew stronger and blew with ever-increasing force till I was fain to run before it. The air became icy cold, and in spite of my exercise, began, I began to suffer. The snow was now falling so thickly and whirling around me in such rapid eddies that I could hardly keep my eyes open. Every now and then the heavens were torn asunder by vivid lightning, and the flashes I could see ahead of me a great mass of trees, chiefly yew and cypress, all heavily coated with snow. 
I was soon among the shelter of the trees, and there, in comparative silence, I could hear the rush of the wind high overhead. Presently the blackness of the storm had become merged with the darkness of night. By and by the storm seemed to be passing away. It now only came in fierce puffs of, or blasts. At such moments the weird sound of the wolf passed close to me by mainly similar sounds surrounding me. Now and again, through the black mass of drifting clouds came a straggling ray of moonlight which lit up the expanse and showed me that it was the edge of a dense mass of cypress and yew trees. As the snow ceased to fall, I walked out from the shelter and began to investigate more closely. It appeared to me that amongst so many old foundations as I had passed, there might be a still standing a house in which, through the ruins, though in ruins, I could still find some, sh some sort of shelter for a while. As I skirted the edge of the copse, I found that a low wall encircled it, and following this I, was pres I presently found an opening. Here the cypresses formed an alley leading up to a square mass of some kind of building. Just as I caught sight of this, however, the drifting clouds obscured the moon, and I passed up the path in darkness. The wind must have grown colder, for I felt myself shiver as I walked, but there was hope of shelter and I groped my way blindly on. I stopped, for there was a sudden stillness. The storm had passed, and perhaps in sympathy with nature's silence, my heart seemed to cease to beat. But this was only momentarily, for suddenly the moonlight broke through the clouds, showing me that I was in a graveyard, and that the square object before me was a great massive tomb of marble, as white as snow that lay on and all around it. With the moonlight there came a fierce sigh of the storm which appeared to resume its course with a long low howl as of many dogs or wolves. I was awed and shocked and I felt the cold perceptibly grow upon me till it seemed to grip me by the heart. Then, while the flood of moonlight still fell on the marble tomb, the storm gave further evidence of renewing as though it were returning on its track. Impelled by some sort of fascination, I approached the sepulchre to see what it was that it, what it was, and why such a thing stood alone in such a place. I walked around it and read over the door at door in German. Countess Dolingen of Graz in Styria sought and found death, 1801. On the top of the tomb, seemingly driven through the solid marble, for the structure was composed of a few vast blocks of stone, was a great iron spike or stake. <clears throat> On going to the back, I saw graven in great Russian letters, the dead travel fast. Then there was something so weird and uncanny about the whole thing. There was something so weird and uncanny about the whole thing that it gave me a turn and made me feel quite faint. I began to wish for the first time that I had taken Johann's advice. Here, a thought struck me which came under almost mysterious circumstances and with a terrible shock. This was Valpurgis Night. Valpurgis Night was when, according to the belief of millions of people, the devil was abroad. When the graves were opened and the dead came forth and walked, when all evil things of earth and air and water held revel, this very place the driver had specially shunned. This was the depopulated village of centuries ago. This was where the suicide lay. This was the place where I was alone, unmanned, shivering with cold in a shroud of snow, with a wild storm gathering again upon me. It took all my philosophy, all the religion I had, all the religion I had been taught, all my courage not to collapse in a paroxysm of fright. And now a perfect tornado burst upon me. The ground shook as though thousands of horses thundered across it, and this time the storm bore its icy wings, not snow, but 
great hailstones which drove such violence that they might have come from the thongs of the Balearic slingers. Hailstones that beat down leaf and branch and made the shelter of the cypresses no more avail than though, than though their stems were standing corn. At least I, at the first I had rushed to the nearest tree, but I was soon fain to leave it and seek the only spot that seemed to afford refuge, the deep Doric doorway of the marble tomb. There, crouching against the massive bronze door, I gained a certain amount of protection from the beating of the hailstones, for now they only drove against me as they ricocheted off the ground and, and the side of the marble. marble. As I leaned against the door, it moved slightly and opened inwards. The shelter of even a tomb was welcome in that pitiless tempest, and I was about to enter it when there came a flash of forked lightning that lit up the whole expanse of the heavens. In the instant, as I am a living man, I saw, as my eyes turned into the darkness of the tomb, a beautiful woman with rounded cheeks and red lips seemingly sleeping on a bier. Then, as the thunder broke overhead, I was grasped as by the hand of a giant and hurled out into the storm. The whole thing was so sudden that before I could realize the shock, moral as well as physical, I found the hailstones beating me down. As at the same time, I had a strange dominating feeling that I was not alone. I looked towards the tomb. Just then there came another blinding flash which seemed to strike the iron stake that surmounted the tomb and to pour through the earth, blasting and crumbling the marble just as, it, just as in a burst of flame. The dead woman rose for a moment of agony while she was lapped in the flame, and a bitter scream of pain was drowned out in the thunder crash. The last thing I heard was this mingling of dreadful sound, as again I was seized in the giant grasp and dragged away, while the hailstones beat on me and the air around seemed reverberant in the howling of wolves. The last sight that I remembered was a vague, white, moving mass as if all the graves around me had sent out their phantoms and their sheltered dead, and that they were closing in on me through the white cloudiness of the driving hail. Gradually there came a sort of vague beginning of consciousness, and a sense of weariness that was dreadful. For a time I remembered nothing, but slowly my senses returned, my feet seemed positively racked with pain, yet I could not move them. They seemed to be numbed. There was an icy feeling at the back of my neck and all down my spine, and my ears, like my feet, were dead yet in torment. But there was in my breast a sense of warmth which was, by comparison, delicious. It was a nightmare, a physical nightmare if one may use such an expression, for some heavy weight on my chest made it difficult for me to breathe. This period of semi-lethargy seemed to remain a long time, and as it faded away I must have slept or swooned. Then came a sort of loathing, like the first stage of seasickness, and a wild desire to be free of something, I knew not what. The vast stillness enveloped in me, as though the world were asleep or dead, only broken by low panting, as of some animal close to me. I felt a warm rasping in my throat. Then came a consciousness of the awful truth which chilled me to the heart and sent the blood surging up through my brain. Some great animal was lying on me, now licking my throat. I feared to stir for some instance of proof, for ins I feared to stir, for some instinctive prudence bade me to lie still, but the brute seemed to realize that there was now some change in me, for it raised its head. Through my eyelashes I saw above me the two great flaming eyes of a gigantic wolf. Its sharp teeth, its sharp white teeth gleamed in the gaping red mouth, and I could feel its hot breath fierce and acrid upon me. 
for another spell of time I remembered no more, then became conscious of a low growl followed by a yelp, renewed again and again. Then seemingly far away I heard a, Hello! Hello! As of many voices calling in unison. Cautiously I raised my head and looked in the direction whence the sound came, but the cemetery blocked my view. The wolf still continued to yelp in a strange way, and a red glare began to move around the grove of cypresses, as though following the sound. As the voices drew closer, the wolf yelped faster and louder. I feared to make either sound or motion. Nearer came the red glow over the white pall, which stretched into the darkness around me. Then, all at once, from beyond the trees, there came at a trot a troop of horsemen bearing torches. <clears throat> The wolf rose from my breast and made for the cemetery. I saw one of the horsemen, soldiers by their caps and their long military cloaks, raise, raise his carbine and take aim. A companion knocked his arm and I heard the ball whiz over my head. He had evidently taken my body for that of the wolf. Another sighted the animal as it slunk away and a shot followed. Then at a gallop the troop rode forward, some towards me, others following the wolf as it disappeared amongst the snow-clad cypresses. As they drew closer, I tried to move, but was powerless, although I could see and hear all that, went, all that went on around me. Two or three of the soldiers jumped from their horses and knelt beside me. One of them raised my head and placed his hand over my heart. Good news, comrades, he cried. His heart still beats. Then some brandy was poured down my throat. It put vigor into me, and I was, able to, I was able to open my eyes and look around. Lights and shadows were moving among the trees, and I heard men call to one another. They drew together, uttering frightened exclamations, and the lights flashed as the others came pouring out of the cemetery, pell-mell, like men possessed. When the further ones came close to us, those who were around me asked them eagerly, Well, have you found him? The reply came out hurriedly. No, no, come away, quick. This is no place to stay in, and all this of all nights. What was it? Was a question asked in all manner of keys. The answer came variously and all indefinitely, and all indefinitely as though the men were moved by some common impulse to speak, yet were restrained by some common fear from giving their thoughts. Eat. Eat. Indeed, gibbered one, whose wits had plainly given out for the moment. A wolf, and yet not a wolf, another put out, put in shudderingly. No use trying for him without the sacred bullet, a third remarked in a more ordinary manner. <laughs> Serves us right for coming out on this night. Truly, we have earned our thousand marks were the ejaculations of a fourth. There was blood on the broken marble, another said after a pause. The lightning never brought that there, and for him, is he safe? Look at his throat. See, comrades, the wolf has been lying on him and keeping his blood warm. The officer looked at my throat and replied, ah, He is all right. His skin is not pierced. What does it all mean? We should never have found him but for the yelping of the wolf. But what became of it? asked the man who was holding my head up and who seemed to be the least panic-stricken of the party, for his hands were steady and without tremor. On his sleeve was the shoveling of a petty officer. It then told answered the man, whose long face was pallid, and who actually shook in terror as he glanced around him fearfully. There are graves enough there in which it may lie. Come, comrades, come quickly. Let us leave this cursed spot. The officer raised me to a sitting posture as he uttered a word of command. Then several men placed me upon a horse. He sprang to the saddle behind me, took me in his arms, gave the word to advance, and turning our faces away from the cypresses, we rode away in swift military order. 
as yet my tongue refused its office, and I was perforce silence. I was perforce silent. I must have fallen asleep for the next morning. I remember that I was finding myself standing up, supported by a soldier on each side of me. It was almost broad daylight, and to the north, a red streak of sunlight was reflected like a path of blood over the waste of snow. The officer was telling the men to say nothing of what they had seen, except that they found an English stranger guarded by a large dog. <laughs> dog? That was no dog! Cut in the man who exhibited such fear. I think I know a wolf when I see one. The young officer answered calmly. I said dog. Dog, reiterated the other ironically. It was evident that the courage was rising with the sun. And pointing to me, he said, look at his throat. Is that the work of a dog, master? Instinctively, I raised my hand to my throat. And as I touched it, I cried out in pain. The men crowded around to look some stooping down from their saddles, and again there came the calm voice of the young officer. A dog, as I said, if aught else was said, we should only be laughed at. I was then mounted behind a trooper, and we rode into the suburbs of Munich. Here we came across a stray carriage into which I was lifted, and I was driven off to the Quatre Saison. The young officer accompanied whilst a trooper followed with his horse, and the others rode off to their barracks. When I arrived, Herr Delbruck rushed so quickly when the steps down the steps to meet me that it was apparent he had been waiting within. Taking me by both hands, he solicitously led me in. The officer saluted me and was turning to withdraw when I recognized his purpose and insisted that he should come to my rooms. Over a glass of wine, I warmly thanked him and his brave comrades for, for saving me. He replied simply that he was more than glad, and that Herr Delbruck had at the f had at the first taken steps to make all the search party to make all the searching party pleased. At which ambiguous utterance, the maître de hotel smiled while the officer pled duty and withdrew. But Herr Delbruck, I inquired. How and why was it that the soldiers searched for me? He shrugged his shoulders as if in deprecation of his own deed, as he replied, I was so fortunate to obtain leave from the commander of the regiment in which I served to ask for volunteers. But how did you know I was lost? I asked. The driver came hither with the remains of his carriage, which he had been, ups which had been upset when the horses ran away. Surely you would not send a search party of soldiers merely on this account. Oh, no, he answered. But even before the coachman arrived, I had this telegram from the boyar whose guest you are. And he took from his pocket the telegram, <clears throat> which he handed to me, and I read, Mistress, be careful of my guest. His safety is most precious to me. Should aught happen to him, or if he be missed, spare nothing to find him and ensure his safety. He is English and therefore adventurous. There are often dangers from snow and wolves at night. Lose not a moment if you suspect harm to him. I answer your zeal with my fortune. Dracula. As I held the telegram in my hand, the room seemed to whirl around me, as if the attentive Matre de Hotel had not caught me. And if the and if the attentive Matre de Hotel had not caught me, I think I should have fallen. There was something so strange in all this, something so weird and impossible to imagine, that there grew on me a sense of my being in some way the sport of opposite forces, the mere vague idea of which seemed in a way to perish. I was certainly under some form of mysterious protection. From a distant country had come, in the very nick of time, a message that took me out of the danger of the slim sleep and the jaws of the wolf. The End 
So that was Dracula's Guest, the uh, deleted first chapter of Dracula by Bram Stoker. And as you can see, this is uh, essentially one of the, one of the first legs of Jonathan Harker's journey to Dracula's castle. And a lot of what happens here happens later on uh, with the uh, with the Gypsy villagers. Um, and so a lot of it is redundant, but at the same time, like, there's something very creepy about this one because what I take away from it is that this village that Harker visits was actually a village that Dracula had destroyed by turning everybody into vampires. And so what we see here is Dracula also has a very watchful and attentive eye over Jonathan because the hand that grabs him and the wolf that uh, holds him down, I'm pretty sure that was Dracula. <laughs> I stole the one ring and saying, yeah, I was totally paying attention, shifty eyes. That's okay. Um, so this was a... Uh, <clears throat> uh, Rock and Roller Skate says, I had no idea this story existed. Thanks for performing. Well, you're quite welcome. Um, and you can find this uh, online anywhere. Uh, it's a public domain story. Um, and like I said, this is... Uh, the deleted first chapter of Dracula. Um, the, the book itself, as we know, uh, actually picks up with um, Jonathan Harker uh, entering Transylvania. Uh, Aravandi saying, I only wish my internet hadn't kicked me out, so I missed the first half. That's, a, that's okay. I'll put the whole thing up online so you can listen to the whole thing. Or you can read it because uh, my reading voice is not great. Uh, I'm I'm good with uh, with the goofy, cartoony voices, not so much with uh, the more subtle accents. I'm working on that. So uh, I apologize if some of the German characters in this came off a little cartoony. Um, but yeah, it's a really good story. Like I, I really enjoyed this, uh, and I hope you did too. So that's going to wrap up uh, Classic Horror for this week, our first of Horror Month. Uh, next week, we will be talking about uh, Edgar Allan Poe and H.P. Lovecraft, um, which is going to be really fun. Uh, these are two writers who I absolutely adore, who have an amazing body of work, and if you can, if you can read them, I highly recommend uh, checking them out reading some of their works. There are very few of their stories that I would say are not engrossing and engaging. Um, so, um, well, thank you. Everybody's complimenting me on my, uh, my voice and my accents. Thank you. I, I know they say, like, you, you, uh, you have your, uh, uh, you're your own worst critic, so. And now Arrow is saying, I should do a dramatic reading of Darkling before the end of the month. I sort of feel like me doing a dramatic reading of Darkling is uh, inappropriate, uh, just because uh, the narrator of Darkling is a woman. I feel like that's uh, that wouldn't work very well. But who knows, maybe I can convince uh, uh, one of my voice actress friends to come on and read a chapter of Darkling. Um, so Rock and Roller Skates is asking which story should I read first? Um, and I'm guessing for Poe and Lovecraft, uh, a couple quick ones that I'll recommend. Um, for Poe, of course, uh, The Telltale Heart, one of my all-time favorites. Um, another really good one is uh, The Mask of the Red Death, uh, The Cask of Amontillado, and uh, The Pit and the Pendulum. Uh, those are some of my favorites. And of course, uh, his poetry, uh, The Raven. Fantastic. And another great poem of his is uh, Bells. The Bells. I don't know if it's The Bells or just Bells. Um, but it's a fantastic uh, poem. 
So uh, those those I would recommend. For H.P. Lovecraft, um, some of the stories that I would recommend uh, starting out with, um, if you want like an interesting primer on the whole Cthulhu mythos, um, I would recommend reading the story uh, The Call of Cthulhu. Um, <clears throat> It, it gives it gives a little it gives a good background onto um, what uh, Cthulhu is and uh, what the mythos is, but it, it goes so much bigger than that um, beyond what's in that story. Um, another one that um, I like is um, yeah, I'm trying to remember the name of it now. Um, Pikmin's Model, which is not part of the Cthulhu mythos. It's its own self-contained story, but it is super, super creepy. Um, and then another one that I like that is part of the Cthulhu mythos, but is very self-contained. Um, and uh, it's very self-contained and is also very creepy in its own right. It's called uh, The Haunter in the Dark. Um, so those are some recommendations for Poe and Lovecraft that I would, uh, give out. Uh, Erivani is saying, I like the one about the heart beating under the floorboards. Well, that would be the Telltale Heart, uh, my all-time favorite Edgar Allan Poe story. Uh-oh, I stole the one ring, screen just went black. I feel like that's a cue for me to maybe, uh, bring this to a close. So, um... So, um, so yeah, those are some, uh, good recommended, uh, stories for Poe and Lovecraft. Um, and, uh, the book of the month for October, since it is Horror Month, is Something Wicked This Way Comes by Ray Bradbury. Um, fantastic book. I highly recommend it. I'd love to, uh, discuss it with all of you at the end of the month. And that will, uh... That will bring us to an end here. Uh, thank you all for uh, joining in. Uh, it seems we have a, a couple new people who have joined in the, into the chat this time around. Um, so thank you all for um, coming. Uh, and I will see you all next week for uh, Poe and Lovecraft. So have a great, have a great week, everybody. Happy Halloween, Happy Horror Month, and never stop reading.